It was November 3rd, 1991, and Blake Newsome loved his job. He had a passion for organization, an undying love of American political history, and was a lifelong member of the Republican Party. That's why he took great pride in his position as a filing clerk at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. Or at least he did, until his horrifying encounter with SCP-1981. The worst day of Blake's life began like any other. He was taking inventory of the archive's wide array of Betamax tapes and making sure that they were all arranged carefully and conformed with the filing system. One by one, he checked footage of speeches and addresses off of his list until he came upon a strange tape that had no business being there. The tape looked to be completely normal, but it hadn't been recorded on the archive inventory. And there was something else off about it. A single white sticker was on the front of the tape with Ronald Reagan cut up while talking, scrawled hastily with what was probably a felt tip marker. Blake was shocked and appalled. They hadn't even spelled the president's name correctly. What poor Mr. Newsom didn't know was that he was about to see something so disturbing that he'd look back on that misspelling like it was a treasured childhood memory. Standard policy for tapes like this would be to review and catalog, or even throw it out if necessary. Typically, a lowly filing clerk like Blake would need to seek approval from his superiors, but curiosity got the better of him. He commandeered one of the library's televisions and Betamax cassette players and started watching the footage. For the first minute or so, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Just the president standing at the podium giving his iconic Evil Empire speech to the National Association of Evangelicals at Sheraton Twin Towers Hotel, Orlando, Florida, on March 8, 1983. However, the second the tape hit the 1 minute and 10 seconds mark, something unnatural began to occur. President Reagan's speech began to veer off as the topic of conversation shifted from the importance of family values to the exquisite taste of human flesh. Blake was taken aback. Surely he was hearing things. But the tape only got worse. President Reagan began to divulge the fact that he enjoyed the taste of young flesh the best, particularly that of infants. As Reagan began to go into detail about how exactly one should best cook an infant if you want to seal in the flavor, the crowd erupted into modest applause. Blake started to feel sick. He'd remembered watching this speech, and President Reagan had said nothing of the sort. Things only got weirder as the president's cheeks suddenly opened up into a long, bleeding gash, as though someone had cut into his face with an invisible knife. As the speech continued, and Reagan's words became more nonsensical and incoherent, the injuries got worse, too. His face developed puncture wounds, like he was being stabbed. Skin in some areas rotted and peeled off. Reagan showed no awareness of the horrifying injuries that seemed to be occurring spontaneously on his body. This was a living nightmare. The tape came to a merciful end 22 minutes in, after President Reagan's throat appeared to be slashed open and his insane speech was reduced to quiet gurgles. It fizzled out into static shortly after, and Blake politely retired to the bathroom to throw up. Was this some sick prank or tampering or camera trickery, perhaps? He didn't know, but the tape was disgusting, and whoever was responsible had to be punished. Newsom contacted the police, hoping obscenity charges could be pressed against the creator of the tape once they were found. The tape was taken into evidence, and a low-level police investigation into the possible culprits began. While the police officers who viewed the tape reported nightmares in the weeks following, the creator of the tape was never found. The investigation truly came to an end when a superior closed the case and the tape disappeared from the evidence locker. This, as you probably could have guessed, was the work of a field agent from the SCP Foundation. Anesthetics were then used to erase the memories of everyone unlucky enough to witness the tape, including Blake Newsom, who could finally rest easy and return to his filing work. The anomalous tape was now in responsible hands. It was given the designation SCP-1981 and given the object class safe due to its easily controlled and self-contained nature. Proper research and testing was now able to begin, and while nothing about the construction of the tape suggested anything inherently anomalous, repeat viewings of the video made it clear that this went far beyond mere doctored footage of a presidential speech. Every single time the tape is played, both the speech made and the injuries received by President Reagan change. The few rules the tape seemed to always follow are that Reagan never reacts to the injuries he's receiving, it always has the same beginning and total runtime, and the speech is always corrupted. The speeches have been described as mostly incoherent, lacking any sort of underlying thematic structure, 
and largely being composed of nonsensical anecdotes and parables. So not that dissimilar from a regular Reagan speech, but the topics always turn incredibly dark and have included torture, mutilation, death, cannibalism, ritual sacrifice, genocide, and more. The range of injuries shown on President Reagan in the videos have included, but are by no means limited to, impalement, mutilation, and some tortures so gruesome that the details have been redacted from official files. On several occasions, the details of President Reagan's speech have also eerily predicted the future. These include successfully predicting the September 11th attacks in 2001 and the outcome of the 2008 Russian presidential election. Incidentally, this isn't even the only Reagan-related SCP to predict the future. No, there's another entity in this incredibly specific niche, SCP-095, a highly degraded copy of a comic known as The Atomic Adventures of Ronnie Reagan. The title character bears a striking resemblance to President Reagan, despite the fact that the comment is confirmed by Foundation Tests to have been written in the early 1930s. The comic is set in the far-off future world of the 1980s and follows a number of Ronnie's exploits in three stories. The first, titled Ronnie vs. Space Admiral Carter, seems to perfectly describe the events of the 1980 presidential election. The second, Space Assassin, mirrors the attempted assassination of President Reagan by John Hinckley Jr. And the third, titled Jungle Planet, retells the Iran-Contra controversies of 1986. These comics were produced under the mysterious and apparently non-existent company, Future Funnies. The Foundation hopes to track down the other comics from this company whenever possible, but they've had no luck on that front. For now, there's only SCP-095. During initial testing, Foundation staff watched the tape frequently in case this strange, corrupted version of President Reagan had any other valuable predictions for the future. However, during one of these screenings, one of the D-Class observation personnel pointed and yelled at the screen in horror. Upon further examination of recorded footage, researchers could see exactly what had concerned the D-Class observer so much. While in other viewings of the tape, President Reagan's press detail had appeared totally normal, in this one something was clearly amiss. Standing among the other dull, suit-wearing political aides was a tall figure dressed in a midnight black cloak with a large conical hood obscuring his face. The figure didn't appear to move in the footage, it just stood there, menacingly. A later survey indicated that this figure would appear in roughly one in seven viewings of the tape. This cloaked figure was designated SCP-1981-1, and he became part of the reoccurring imagery in the nightmares that often followed a viewing of SCP-1981. Naturally, despite containment and preservation attempts, the Foundation was aware that just like any normal tape, natural magnetic interference would eventually degrade it beyond use. Attempts to copy the footage onto another Betamax tape failed to reproduce the anomalous effects. That's why the Foundation has painstakingly recorded any video and audio they could via a standard commercial camcorder. In one particularly terrifying playback, SCP-1981-1 took the President's place at the podium, staring directly into the camera. The words, I see you, appeared over a black screen shortly after. Staff members were ordered never to make an attempt at communicating with the figure, and instead contact a level 4 superior if such an event occurs during a playback again. The frightening and unfortunate effects of SCP-1981 would come to their logical conclusion under the watchful eye of Dr. James Kyle Robinson, managing archivist of inert safe class objects and anomalous items at Site-73. He was contacted by Special Agent Arnold Rodriguez and Special Agent Ethan Tate, members of the Secret Service with a duty to protect President Reagan. Word had gotten to Reagan that there was an anomalous artifact in the possession of the Foundation that directly pertained to him, and he wanted to see it. Dr. Robinson obtained files and transcripts pertaining to SCP-1981 and handed them over to the agents, but refused to allow President Reagan to see the tape directly without approval from O5 Command. Mm -hmm but Reagan and the agents were persistent. Eventually, O5 Command ordered a private screening of the tape for President Reagan at the Sanford Chemical Processing Plant, a front business owned and operated by the Foundation for Amnestic Production. Dr. Robinson offered President Reagan the use of amnestics after the session completed, but Reagan declined. The screening took place in Conference Room B, and the tape was replayed three times. It was on the third playback that things took an interesting turn. 
As the mutilated Reagan on the screen began to rant about drinking the blood of a child from the skull of Vladimir Putin, Reagan began to silently mouth along the words as though he remembered them. He spoke about beings known as the Destroyers and potential apocalyptic events to come. After the screening, Reagan once again refused the offer of amnestics and departed. It seemed as though all was well, until a violent break-in at the Sanford chemical processing plant that left a night guard dead. A large number of amnestics had been stolen during the break-in, and security footage showed that Agent Tate and Rodriguez had been responsible. The two agents were tracked down and traced to the residence of Ronald Reagan, where the Foundation came upon a disturbing sight. The agents had pillaged large quantities of Class A and B amnestics and supplied them to President Reagan, who, at some point after observing SCP-1981, had been driven into a dangerous madness. The two agents wanted to cure him before he caused harm to himself or others, but their bungling had come with severe consequences. Misapplying such a high quantity of amnestics had essentially destroyed Reagan's mind, and while the Foundation was able to stabilize his condition, his impaired memory and cognitive function would leave him unable to care for himself independently. In order to cover up for this grievous mistake, a cover story was concocted about Reagan falling victim to Alzheimer's and facing severe cognitive decline as a result. Both agents Tate and Rodriguez were fired for their actions, had their memories wiped by the Foundation, and were assigned new identities. Dr. Robinson, for his part in the disaster, had to face a Foundation Ethics Committee disciplinary hearing. While SCP-1981 continues to be classified as safe due to its unlikeliness to ever breach containment, when you consider the havoc it wrought on the mind of its singular target, safe is hardly the word that comes to mind. It's enough to make you wonder what other tapes are lurking out there, just waiting to be found. Every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. It's an iconic line from It's a Wonderful Life, and even if you don't believe in angels, it is a pleasant image. After all, angels are the embodiment of goodness and light. So an angel getting its wings has to be a good thing, right? Well, as anyone who's ever eaten one too many Christmas cookies can tell you, it's possible to have too much of a good thing. Even something that sounds like the embodiment of all things good in theory can become deadly when taken to the extreme. That is where SCP-469, also known as the Many-Winged Angel, comes in. This angel-like creature is anything but innocent, and in fact it has been responsible for multiple deaths of SCP Foundation personnel during its captivity. SCP-469 may be deadly, but it is also undeniably beautiful in a mysterious, ethereal way. When first seen, it appears to be nothing more than a massive pile of pristine white feathers, like something out of a pillow commercial. The pile measures 24 feet in diameter and weighs at least 2 tons. However, like many of the entities contained within the walls of the Foundation's countless containment sites, all is not as it seems with 469. What looks at first glance to be a pile of feathers is in fact a dense, curled mass of giant wings. The wings vary in size from the tiny wingspan of a sparrow to the staggering 3.6 meter wingspan of the wandering albatross. The one thing they have in common is their plumage, with each wing being covered with the same glossy white feathers. The Foundation was able to perform a series of x-rays on the mass of wings, revealing a skeletal structure beneath the feathers. Like those of a bird, the wings' bones are hollow. However, they are unnaturally soft and flexible, allowing for a range of motion that no known bird possesses. This accounts for the curvature of the wings and their ability to coil tightly into each other. The X-ray also provided the first and only recorded glimpse at the creature hiding underneath all the feathers. At the center of the layers upon layers of wings is a humanoid creature curled into a fetal position. In defiance of the laws of natural anatomy, every single wing appears to be fused to this creature's spine. How would it be able to move under the weight of these wings, or even if it could, is as of yet unknown. The first Foundation personnel lost to SCP-469 were D-Class personnel D-112 and D-624, who were sent in to investigate the nature of the creature and attempt to contact the humanoid entity identified on the X-rays. 112 and 624 entered the room, 
equipped with gloves and protective eye gear, as scientists watched the situation unfold on a monitor on a video feed. No one expected much to come of the encounter. The working hypothesis was the layers of feathers would simply be too thick to get through without seriously damaging the bones. It would be a fairly uneventful experiment, or so they thought. 112 approached SCP-469 first, and attempted to part a section of its feathers with his hands as 624 stood back and observed. The moment his fingertips touched the feathers, a rustling sound filled the room. The feathers began to quiver, shaking as if all waking up at once from a deep slumber. Suddenly, in the blink of an eye, the hundreds and hundreds of wings unfurled and pulled 112 into their depths. He was swept into a swirl of feathers and, within seconds, he had disappeared from view completely. Though 624 and the scientists watching on their monitor could no longer see him, they could certainly hear him. From the moment the wings pulled him into the sea of feathers, 112 had begun to scream in agony. His screams persisted, growing louder and more desperate even as the voice cracked and grew weak. 624 stood, frozen in place with fear and shock. 624 was ordered to attempt to retrieve 112 from the feathers, but made no move to do so. He simply stared at the feathers, eyes wide, face pale, as the pain shrieks of his colleague bounced off the sterile white walls of the containment room. A guard called over the intercom, threatening to terminate 624 if he did not attempt to remove 112 from SCP-469's grasp. This warning seemed to shock 624 back into action, and he made a run for the center feathers, arms up to protect his face. Again, the sound of rustling as the feathers began to quake. The wings unfurled once more, and 624 did not even have a chance to turn back before he was pulled in to meet the same dismal fate as the other D-Class. His screams of pain joined 112 as the scientists watching over the monitor could do nothing to help them. As the two men cried out in pain and horror from within their winged prison, something began to happen that the scientists had never seen before. The feathers started to shake again, faster than before, and at first the wings appeared to be unfolding again. Upon second look, though, it was clear they hadn't moved. There were simply more of them now. As the men continued to scream, more feathers appeared the wings stretching out and elongating as new wings sprouted as if from nowhere. SCP-469 appeared to be feeding on the sound of their screams and using that energy to expand. It was only after several long minutes when the screaming finally stopped that the growth of the wings did too. At this point, the wings shifted again, expelling the bodies of 112 and 624 from within its folds, dropping them limply on the ground. Though their deaths were unfortunate, the loss of 112 and 624 did reveal some new information about SCP-469. First, that it could grow, and apparently needed to feed on sounds in order to do so. Second, that it was deadly to humans, and most likely to other living things as well. Autopsies of 112 and 624's corpses would later reveal exactly what happened to them, and how SCP-469 kills its prey. Though 469's feathers may look as though they would be soft to the touch, each feather is actually made up of sharp barbs that are capable of piercing clothing and skin. These barbs release a neurotoxin into the system that activates every pain receptor in the body of the victim. The neurotoxin present in these feathers has not been identified anywhere else in nature, but is somewhat similar in structure and function to the neurotoxins excreted by the cone snail and in the bite of the blue-ringed octopus. In addition to the pain-inducing neurotoxin, the feathers also carry several unidentified stimulant compounds, where the neurotoxin on its own would induce enough pain for the affected party to pass out almost immediately. The stimulant served to keep the victim conscious. SCP Foundation scientists posit that this is so that 469 can get as much noise, in this case in the form of screams, out of its pain as possible, and achieve maximum growth before the captive creature dies or goes into shock. Further experiments confirm this theory and show that SCP-469 will react similarly when exposed to any living creature capable of making a sound and experiencing pain, not just humans. Non-living matter, though, including dead animals, elicit no response from 469. Additional experiments were then undertaken that involved applying various different sounds in order to test their effect on SCP-469's growth. Though it feeds on any sounds produced in its presence, it seems to respond most strongly to musical sounds, exhibiting a particularly strong response to classical music. 
No sound elicits a stronger reaction from this creature, however, than the sound of ringing bells. It is rumored that when a bell was rung in the presence of 469, the humanoid at the center of the feathers is said to have moved for the first time on record. Apparently whatever is at the center appeared to wake up and unfurl its wings, revealing itself. But unfortunately, all security footage of this incident has been wiped, and the data has been expunged from the record leaving the creature's true form a mystery. You may be remembering that four members of Foundation personnel on record were lost to SCP-469, and that only two have been mentioned so far. The second pair of casualties resulted when the Foundation attempted to terminate SCP-469. Believing that there was no more scientific benefit to keeping it alive, or at least that the possible benefits did not outweigh the risks, it was ordered that SCP-469 be terminated by any means necessary. Two skilled personnel, Dr. Jones and Dr. Smith, were sent into the containment facility in hazmat gear, armed with several sharp instruments. They were to attempt to use these to cut through the forest of feathers and soft bones until they could reach the humanoid at the center. It was presumed that once they did, and the creature no longer had the protection of its poisonous feathers, that it would be relatively easy to kill. They could not have been more wrong. Dr. Jones approached the dense cover of feathers with a pair of sharpened gardening shears, while Dr. Smith opted for a machete. At first, the strategy appeared to be working. Dr. Jones made several quick cuts, with feathers fluttering to the floor and sticking to the hazmat suit as Dr. Smith slashed into the feathers with his machete, making similarly promising progress. However, the situation quickly took a turn for the worse when Dr. Jones dropped her shears and let out a blood-curdling scream. The feathers had taken a little longer to get through the suit to her skin, but somehow they managed to find a way just the same. Smith grabbed Jones and attempted to make a break for it, but he was too slow and far too close to the feathers already. The wings wrapped around them and swallowed them both up, leaving the researchers outside helpless to do anything but listen to their screams and wait for them to go quiet. After several minutes, they finally did, and now larger SCP-469 had officially claimed another two Foundation personnel. Obviously, 469 could not be terminated using any methods that would place the responsible personnel within its grasp. That was simply too risky. So, the Foundation selected a team of D-Class personnel to attempt to burn the feathers with an array of flamethrowers. Though the feathers were vulnerable to fire and began to blacken and disintegrate on contact, the sound of the flames being expelled was loud enough to feed SCP-469. Its growth was so quick in response to the noise that the fire could not keep up with the amount of new feathers and wings being produced. By the same time the flamethrowers ran out of propellant, 469 was the same size it had been when they started. Other terminations have been discussed, including the possibility of submerging the entire creature in a highly corrosive acid, but so far this has not yet been attempted. Whatever they end up trying, it is clear that nothing that produces a significant amount of noise will be able to kill 469. So where is it now? What's become of this perverse angel with the never-ending wings? Currently, it is kept in an airtight, soundproof chamber where nothing can trigger the growth of any more wings. So, what is it? An angel? A demon? A twisted, mutated bird of some kind? It is entirely possible that we will never know. But It's a Wonderful Life had something right, even by accident. Every time a bell rings, something, twisted and deadly though it may be, gets its wings. It was July of 2004, and Bill Murray was enjoying the peak of an extremely successful career. Not only had the iconic actor starred in some of the most beloved comedies of the 20th century, including Ghostbusters and Groundhog Day, he'd voiced the main character of the recently released live-action Garfield movie. It'd been a financial success, but it was a critical flop. Not that this bothered Bill. He was happy with the performance. And the paycheck. What he wouldn't be quite as happy about was the horrifying encounter he was about to have with SCP-3166. On July 8th, Bill was enjoying a cold drink on the porch of his luxurious Beverly Hills home. The sky was beginning to darken as the sun set in the west. It was a blissful evening. His wife Jennifer was inside, watching TV. Nothing seemed particularly out of the ordinary until he noticed a quick flash of orange in the distance. It was almost too fast to register, this large orange shape darting past the corner of his eye. For a second, he entertained the thought that it might have been an escaped tiger, 
but it was gone too fast to really tell. Bill finished his drink and headed inside. He had enough for one night. The next morning he got up to read the paper and found the Garfield movie getting slaughtered by the critics. One review stated, No one can accuse Garfield the movie of infidelity to its source. It faithfully conveys the banality of Jim Davis's cartoon. Another called it, A film without energy and without spirit. He put the paper down and ate his breakfast. A few blows to the ego were worth it for the paydays that came with big-budget family films. Just then, his wife came to him with a strange question. Were you walking around downstairs in the middle of the night? No, he hadn't. He'd been sleeping like a baby. Why did she ask? Well, Jennifer said, I heard some rustling downstairs last night. It sounded like something big. He hadn't heard anything, though, and told her it was probably just her imagination. He put it out of his mind and continued about his day. He decided he would keep his eyes peeled for that orange blur again, though. Bill didn't see anything peculiar the rest of the morning and went to a local cafe for lunch. He ordered a coffee and a cream cheese bagel, then made a quick trip to the bathroom while his food was prepared. When Bill returned to his table, though, there was something strange. Instead of a bagel, there was a large heaping of lasagna on the table. What was going on? This cafe didn't even serve lasagna. Bill knew something was terribly wrong. Things only got stranger when Bill came home to find a small tuft of orange fur snagged on the frame of his front door. And it wasn't synthetic fur like you'd see on plush toys or stuffed animals. No, this was real animal fur. Maybe someone was just goofing off or trying to play some weird prank on him. But it didn't feel like it. Deep down, Bill Murray knew that he was in grave danger. Whoever or whatever was behind this, it wanted to hurt him. That night, his worst fears were realized. Bill's wife had left town for the week, and he was headed to the kitchen in the middle of the night for a glass of water, when he saw something. A huge figure moving up against the glass door leading to his backyard. The thing was huge, nearly seven feet tall, with a bloated, fur-covered, misshapen body that was pressed up against the door. Its fur was bright, garish orange, a cartoon orange. Strangest of all, though, was the sound it was making. It sounded like it was purring. Bill backed away from the door and then ran back to his room to hide. The whole night he sat cowering as he heard scratching against the walls, like something was trying to get in. He was terrified and too scared to do anything, even move. Finally, as morning broke, the noises seemed to stop. Bill had to do something. He couldn't let this nightmare go on another night. What if things got worse? What if that thing managed to get inside? He called the local police and when they arrived, he explained the incredibly strange situation as best he could. He told them he was being stalked by some kind of huge cat, or at least someone dressed like a huge cat. Also, there was lasagna involved. The officers interviewing him could barely contain their laughter as he told them his story. A giant orange cat? Perhaps, one of them theorized. He angered some kind of obsessive Garfield fan through his involvement in the live-action movie. After all, the original comic had been running for years and had been extremely popular. Who knows what kind of nutjobs were obsessed with seeing only a faithful adaptation of the source material. As the officers departed, Bill was confident that they weren't taking him seriously. He couldn't rely on any of them for protection. Thankfully, from a multi-decade movie career, he had plenty of disposable income and decided to hire a private security team to protect him while he looked into this mystery. He had two trained bodyguards positioned around his home at all times for the next month. They were armed and given the cryptic orders to fire on anything orange. Meanwhile, Bill began to fall down a Garfield rabbit hole. He felt strangely compelled to research all the Garfield media he could find, as though the answer to his terrifying situation was somehow hidden between the lines. Bill explored the entire backlog of thousands of comic strips. He read the books and interviews with Jim Davis. He watched the cartoons and straight-to-DVD animated movies. Ironically, for a guy who'd recently portrayed the lasagna-loving orange cat, Bill had never felt quite so immersed in the character before. He found the strange pathos in the routine of Garfield and his friends. One particular comic really piqued his interest, though. Originally published in October of 1989, the comic began with Garfield being woken up by a strange chill, an almost eerie sensation. The character observed aloud that he didn't feel like he was in his own home. 
He explored his little home further, trying to find his owner John or his housemaid and sometimes nemesis, Odie, but found nothing. As Garfield remarked on feeling alone, a purple speech box delivered the sinister message. You have no idea how alone you are, Garfield. He then finds that his home looks like it's been abandoned for years. The for sale sign outside is practically ancient. Garfield slowly comes to a horrifying revelation. Everyone really is gone, and his adventures and friends now exist only in his imagination. He's trapped in a prison of his own creation, trying to stave off his endless loneliness in denial about the reality of his situation. The comic ended with a quote directly from Jim Davis himself saying, An imagination is a powerful tool. It can tint memories of the past, shade perceptions of the present, or paint a future so vivid that it can entice or terrify, all depending upon how we conduct ourselves today. As he read those words, hmm. Bill Murray felt a chill down his spine. Why had he wanted to get involved in the Garfield movie in the first place? What had he gotten himself into? Before he could slip any deeper into his own mind, Bill heard a faint, choked scream downstairs. He felt his breath catch in his throat. He was terrified, but needed to see what was happening. He carefully and quietly began to creep down the stairs. At the bottom, he poked his head around a corner, and that's when he saw a member of his security detail lying dead on the floor. His face was blue from asphyxiation. His mouth was stuffed with lasagna. It looked like he had been force-fed to death. Bill wanted to scream, but he couldn't, or maybe knew he shouldn't. Just then, he heard a soft, meaty thumping noise coming from the nearby living room. He didn't know why, but he felt compelled to approach, as if by forces beyond his control. He made his way to the living room, and when he'd got there, he saw where the noise was coming from. Bill's jaw dropped in pure horror. There was the other member of his security detail, lying limp and lifeless under a giant orange figure. It was a grotesquely huge creature, wearing what looked to be a kind of crude Garfield outfit made of sewn-together cat pelts. It stank of pasta and rotten meat. In its giant paw, it held a golden trophy, which it was using to pound the security guard's head into mush, while making quiet, cat-like purring noises. The creature suddenly stopped and looked up, locking eyes with Bill. The fear of death came over him. He froze as the giant, freakish Garfield stepped over Donnie's corpse and began to come towards him. Bill turned and ran, but Garfield was gaining on him. Before he could make it to the front door, the creature knocked him over. He was laid out on the ground, looking up at it as it reached into its own body cavity and began to pull out handfuls of lasagna. He was about to shove a wad of the horrible, decaying pasta into Bill's mouth when suddenly a ding was heard and the creature stopped. It looked up as if sniffing the air, and then suddenly turned and lumbered towards the kitchen. Bill watched as the Garfield monster entered the kitchen where, somehow, there was a steaming hot fresh lasagna sitting in the open oven. The creature had sensed the presence of external lasagna and felt the compulsion to integrate it into its body, grabbing fistfuls and shoving it into itself. Just then, a group of highly trained SCP Foundation personnel burst into the room and subdued the creature. It had been an ambush. The Foundation had been tipped off to the presence of the creature by monitoring the local police department dispatches, and the report of a seven-foot-tall comic book cat terrorizing a Hollywood actor was definitely worth looking into. The monster that had almost taken Bill Murray's life was SCP-3166, a deadly pataphysical being that tends to manifest around people somehow involved in the Garfield intellectual property. It appears whenever the public perception of Garfield falls out of favor, and because Bill had starred in the critically panned Garfield movie, he was currently at the very top of SCP-3166's hit list. Thankfully, he managed to survive his terrifying ordeal, and was administered amnestics by Foundation personnel so that he could return to his normal life. This frightening and mysterious creature has been around since 1989, appearing after the publication of the haunting Garfield comic that Bill had read that very night. It appeared in the office of United Media, who were the publishers of the Garfield comic strip at the time, and began wrecking havoc. Since then, the creature's manifestation has been a constant threat whenever Garfield loses its popularity or audience. 
As a result, the Foundation has spent years as the funding source behind all Garfield media, and even planting hypnotic mimetics into the comic strips to ensure that there is always a loyal fan base. The fur is indeed real, organic cat fur, albeit an unnaturally orange color. And instead of organs, the creature is filled with lasagna. Worst of all, though, is that testing has revealed that the meat in the lasagna is genetically identical to the flesh of Garfield's creator, Jim Davis. How did this thing come into existence? Perhaps it was Jim's sheer force of imagination that dragged it into being. As he himself said, an imagination is a powerful tool. All in all, it's lucky that Bill Murray was able to survive his encounter and return to his normal life. Well, as normal as life can be for Bill Murray. And if you see Bill Murray, don't bother asking him about SCP-3166. The amnestics were quite effective, and just as he's fond of saying himself, no one will ever believe you. In a remote part of Russia, a mysterious disease outbreak was tearing through a tiny farming village with terrifying side effects. There was no cure, no clue to where it came from, and worst of all, the disease's terrifying impact didn't end with death. No, it was after those carrying the disease died that the real horrors started. After an agonizing fever that leaves the victims writhing in pain, they quickly succumb to the disease, only to rise from their graves to wreak havoc on the living. The virus continues to spread until the corpses outnumber those trying to hide from them as the world spirals into almost certain ruin. It sounds like the plot of a zombie movie, but for the SCP Foundation, this is anything but fiction. And the terror that unfolded in that little Siberian town is the first recorded encounter with SCP-610, also known as the flesh that hates. First, livestock began to vanish from farms. Theft or wild animals were suspected, but no suspects could be found, and no mutilated remains turned up. The animals weren't being stolen, and they weren't being eaten, so what happened to them? With no more animals left to lose, the farmers themselves then began to disappear. But the authorities refused to take the missing persons' cases seriously. The missing farmers' families would contact the police, make a report, and then the whole thing was forgotten. It was written off just as another unsolved disappearance which wasn't uncommon in the wild and unforgiving region. Then, the police themselves began to disappear. The families of the missing farmers would sometimes report strange sounds from the surrounding woods, describing moans and inhuman screeches of pain. One young boy reported seeing a cow with what he described as tentacles lurking around the edge of the trees. Regional police were dispatched to the location and ordered to investigate and report back on their findings within 24 hours. But the units sent to the area didn't report back and were never heard from again. Upon learning of the reports, the Russian government grew increasingly concerned, fearing domestic insurgency or foreign espionage of some kind could be at play. They sent a small team of special agents to the area and one by one, those agents disappeared, just like the others before them. It seemed no one who went into the village after the disappearances started ever came out again. They had all simply vanished. Desperate for answers, the Russian government contacted the only people in the world who could help, the SCP Foundation. What the Foundation found over the course of their investigation would shock and unnerve them, going beyond anything they had previously discovered. Before the investigation officially began, the affected area was sealed off by the Russian government. Not knowing if it would be safe to send researchers into the containment perimeter, the Foundation set up a small camera-mounted unit, nicknamed Herbie, to capture footage of whatever remained of the village. The images captured by Herbie revealed what exactly had become of the people in this doomed village, and the true nightmarish nature of SCP-610. SCP-610 is a Keter-class entity, meaning it's an anomaly that's exceedingly difficult to contain consistently or reliably, with containment procedures often being extensive and complex. 610 is a highly contagious skin disease that initially manifests like an ordinary allergic reaction, with symptoms including increased sensitivity, itching, and a rash. But within just three hours of those initial symptoms appearing, the rash starts to turn into masses of scar tissue on the chest and arms. These masses spread over the legs and back of the victim and completely consume them in thick, rubbery flesh within five hours. Once they're covered, the victim will cease all vital functions. Unfortunately for them, and doubly so for those around them, they do not stay dead. About three minutes after expiring, 
the victim's vitals will restart at a heightened rate, and the masses of flesh encasing their body will begin to move and multiply, mutating them into a form beyond anything resembling the human they once were. The specific type of mutation varies from case to case, but has included the head becoming massive and bulbous, the growth of extra limbs, and, in especially gruesome cases, the victim's body splitting apart to allow extra tendrils of flesh to sprout from the open wound. Occasionally, an infected person will stop moving and become rooted to the ground in a set location. Once it is settled, their flesh will spread itself across the ground, encasing all nearby objects in flaps of scar tissue. The infected that maintain their mobility are highly aggressive, even violent, and will attempt to infect any living thing that comes into their line of sight. The disease does not only infect humans, and can take over any living organism within a matter of hours. Due to the highly contagious and dangerous nature of the disease, safe observation of infected specimens and areas is only possible with drones and mounted cameras. This brings us back to Herbie, the first such mounted camera to record footage of the infected area. Herbie was deployed to an infection site, also known as Site A, without any damage. It remained at the outside perimeter of the village for two hours, observing several infected humans and fire damage to many of the homes, before following an infected into an intact house. Herbie's camera feed captured the infected person entering the house and sitting down at the table inside. There were several other infected humans in the house, and one unidentified infected creature that remained immobile under the table. After viciously assaulting one of the other infected humans, the infected returned to the table and began to lay out plates on top of it. Pieces of its flesh began to wriggle and tear away from its body, before settling onto each plate. Once the plates were filled, the infected sitting at the table began to grab at the flesh and crush it into their mouths, in a perverse imitation of a normal mealtime gathering. After capturing this stomach-churning display, Herbie left the house and continued to explore the village. The recorded footage of a large stack of bodies that seemed to be made up of both Russian military and civilians, with an infected sitting on top. As Herbie maneuvered towards the remains of the town hall, an infected grabbed the rover off the ground. Herbie's camera was able to capture the face of the infected that grabbed the rover. The face was that of a young girl, around 10 years old, strangely intact atop a large, distorted body. The final moments of Herbie's camera feed captured the infected girl's face bursting open, revealing tendrils of flesh that pulled Herbie into the gaping maw. Then, the feed cut to black. Herbie was regarded as lost, but the video feed briefly resumed five hours later, showing the camera covered with an unidentified slime. After this, the video feed was cut for good, and Herbie abandoned Insight A. The Foundation has sent several manned expeditions into Site A, where many expedition forces have fallen victim to the infected. Several operatives were also lost in an earthquake that revealed a network of underground tunnels. A manned expedition into these tunnels was attempted, and the video feed that was captured by the researchers on the expedition was deeply disturbing. There were images of an abandoned church filled with infected, and a mass of uninfected or partially infected human captives. The final moments of the video feed from this expedition captured several operatives being murdered by an infected human wielding a farming scythe, indicating that the infected are capable of using simple weaponry in addition to brute force. The use of this weapon, paired with the presence of captives in the underground tunnels, paints a terrifying picture of the kind of organization the infected are capable of. No more manned expeditions have been attempted, or if they have, they have been highly classified. Ordinarily, once a new SCP is discovered, it is placed in containment at the Foundation, with special procedures in place so that it can be studied or even neutralized in the rare occasions where it's deemed necessary. When it comes to SCP-610, though, containment might just be impossible. It simply covers too much area and is too dangerous to expose to human researchers. Instead, all infected areas have been isolated with the permission of the Russian government. There is an official perimeter established around these areas, and any civilians that approach them are told to leave under the pretense of ongoing military operations. For once, a top-secret military project is the more innocent answer. Armed guards are placed at the perimeter of every infected area, and any living thing with symptoms of SCP-610 spotted near the perimeter is to be immobilized, killed, and burned from as far away as possible. Any living thing that comes in contact with SCP-610 whether a soldier, a scientist, or a civilian, is immediately terminated, 
and their remains destroyed. If someone comes within three meters of an infected organism, they will be quarantined and remotely examined to determine if they have been infected. While the spread of SCP-610 can be airborne, it has been determined to be far less contagious when spread through air particles as opposed to physical contact. The infection sites remain active to this day like modern-day leper colonies. Though they are isolated from the general population, and the military is doing everything in their power to contain the infected, SCP-610 is still very much alive. It is rare for an entity to exist that the Foundation cannot truly contain, but can only try to guard against. And that makes this infection all the more terrifying. Who knows how much it has mutated over the years, growing, spreading, hungry for new hosts. There is still so much that the Foundation does not know about the flesh that hates, such as how it works, what it can do, or even where it came from, since the origin of the first infection is still, at this point, entirely unknown. It has shown itself to be capable of learning, planning, and protecting itself. So who is to say that it couldn't figure out a way to escape from its isolated area? It is so highly contagious and spreads so quickly that just one tiny infected rabbit and one inattentive soldier could be enough for SCP-610 to reach the general population. If it did, its violent, destructive nature and hatred for all life would mean that everything, not just the people, but animals, plants, and the world itself, could be at risk. And no one is ready for this kind of infection, a disease that turns the human body against itself, turns our skin into a weapon and a tomb, stripping away identity, humanity, and everything that isn't made of the same hateful flesh. So let's hope that the perimeter holds. And the next time you feel a little itchy, try not to think about what might happen next. It's the holiday season. Outside, it's cold and there's snow blanketing the ground. But inside, you're warm and gathered around the light of a roaring fireplace and a glowing Christmas tree. This is what Christmas is all about. Warmth, joy, and togetherness. But just because you're comfortable doesn't mean you're safe. You were so busy opening presents and stuffing yourself at dinner that you didn't notice the face pressed up against the window. That long, gaunt face with the staring eyes, the wide mouth full of yellow teeth, and the scraggly white beard. You don't know it yet, but within a few days, you'll be dead. You might be able to avert this horrible fate, if you knew what exactly you were dealing with. SCP-4666, also known as the Yule Man, a Keter-class Christmas monster so violent, sadistic, and terrifying, he makes Krampus look like Jolly Saint Nick. And this year, just like every other, he's planning on being very, very naughty. The SCP Foundation began cataloging the Yule Man in 1974 after a string of violent and eerily similar home invasions during the holiday season, but they have reason to believe that this entity has been around for a whole lot longer. Over 2,000 years, in fact. Stories that describe what looked to be Yule Man massacres date back as far as the 1st century BC in Scandinavia, and there have been reports of similar clusters of events happening around the same time every year since. This monster is prolific, and may have one of the highest body counts of any creature under observation by the Foundation. The Yule Man's trail of destruction became clearer in the 18th century, as accounts of the carnage it leaves became more detailed. Later still, Authorities even managed to find physical evidence like the Yule Man's fingerprints, which are similar to human fingerprints, but display a distinct double-whirl pattern not seen in human fingerprints. Much about the anomalous nature of the Yule Man is still unknown, though, and the Foundation has yet to discover an effective way to contain it. Their only hope is intercepting it before it can get its long, gnarled fingers on its intended prey. Maybe you're feeling worried or that you're being watched. You have good reason to be afraid, because during his yearly active period, the 12 days between December 21st and January 2nd, he's always searching for prey. Nowhere is safe, because while it was initially believed that he only appeared to those who live north of 40 degrees latitude, it's now believed that much like Santa Claus, the Yule Man operates worldwide. Anyone could be in his sights right now, 
blissfully unaware of the nightmare coming down the tracks towards them. Thankfully, the SCP Foundation, through analysts of these attacks, which are known as Weisnacht events, they've been able to find certain patterns. But first, what does the creature known as the Yule Man even look like? Much like SCP-096, the Yule Man is a long and lanky humanoid, standing about two meters tall, who resembles an emaciated human of European descent and never wears any clothes or other coverings despite the frigid temperatures he operates in. You might be sad if you're spending Christmas alone, but it at least guarantees you safety from the Yule Man, as he only appears at the homes of families with a child under the age of eight present. He also seems to favor isolated and rural locations, and Weissnacht events only occur when there's a healthy covering of snow on the ground during the event, hence the name which means White Knight in English. It's also vital that you recognize the three distinct stages of a Weissnacht event too, or you won't be seeing much of the new year. The first stage occurs during the space of a week. Children in the home might start to seem worried or afraid. They might tell you that they see something strange in the distance. The figure of a man they don't recognize, standing just far enough away that you can't fully make him out, except that he's really tall. Of course, you probably won't see anything, and your instinct will be to tell them there's nothing to be afraid of. Even when they tell you, through tears, that there's a man pressing his face up against their bedroom window at night. But they are right to be afraid, and you should be too. Already at this point, your only hope is to try and spread the word as soon as possible. Report the incident to the local police, write about it on Facebook, tweet about it whatever it takes. The SCP Foundation has operatives trawling the internet and monitoring police reports constantly during this period, especially for reports of mysterious men in the snow watching homes from a distance. Getting the Foundation's attention is your best hope of stopping this thing. And if you don't, next comes Stage 2, taking place between nights 8 and 11 of the active period. No longer will the Yule Man just be lurking on the periphery, now he's getting closer. You'll start to hear strange noises in your attic or on the roof. Noises that sound almost like footsteps. That's crazy, you think. It's probably just an animal. But then, the smell starts. An awful rotten stench that fills the house. But no matter how hard you look, you can't find the source. Finally, on the last night of December, you'll tell yourself that you'll take this matter to the police. But of course, it's already too late. The Yule Man is here for the twelfth night. The Weissnacht is finally upon you. At this point, one of two scenarios will happen. In the first, you and your entire family will be tortured and murdered, except the youngest child, who the Yule Man will kidnap. The SCP Foundation keeps files on a number of notable instances of this kind of Weissnacht, and the details are truly gruesome. Reports of incidents have involved crucifixion, the removal of tongues, burning, dismemberment, post-mortem bite marks, and decapitation. In all instances, though, the entire family was killed except the youngest child, who simply disappeared. The Yule Man is a merciless and sadistic beast. You're now probably wondering, if that's the first of two Weissnacht possibilities, what's the second? In the second, if you're tremendously lucky, you and your family will survive. But that doesn't mean you won't face a grisly experience. In this scenario, which occurs during about 15% of Weissnacht events, you'll hear footsteps throughout the night, but thankfully you wake up alive. And when you do so, there are gifts waiting for you. The problem is, all these gifts are made out of human body parts. For example, in 1976 in Canada, one family received the gift of a ball made from a severed human head wrapped in skin. In Kazakhstan in 1903, a family received a flute made from a hollowed out human femur. And in the Netherlands in 2003, a family received a wooden hairbrush, covered in human teeth ranging from 400 years old to a mere few days. These gruesome gifts are referred to as SCP-4666-A, and it was one of these gifts that gave us the best insight yet available into the true nature of the Yule Man. Several gifts were dropped off at a family's residence in Huna, Alaska in 2018, but most notably among them was the horrific SCP-4666-A-0960, a life-size doll made from a human body with its eyes removed and mouth sewn shut. Worst of all, though, was that the girl was still alive. The family who received this twisted gift was given a me sticks by the Foundation, 
and the living doll was taken for medical treatment. Before succumbing to her extensive injuries, the girl was able to deliver some insights into what exactly happened to the children who were abducted during Weissnacht events. The children taken by the Yule Man are forced into a large sack that seems much bigger on the inside than it appears as he makes his rounds, traveling from house to house, murdering and kidnapping. His victims are taken to a kind of underground grotto and workshop filled with bones, like a twisted Santa's workshop where they're forced to make toys out of the bodies of their fellow victims. During this time, the Yule Man will continue to torture and torment his victims. He'll even take some of them away to cook and eat whenever he feels like it. When asked how she was turned into this human doll, the girl told Foundation personnel that her fellow victims were forced to turn her into this by the Yule Man when she became too weak to continue making toys herself. Her chilling last words were, When you can't make the toys, you become the toys. So if strange things happen to you and your family between the 21st of December and the 1st of January, don't ignore it. After all, you never know who's watching. But if it is the Yule Man's grinning face pressed up against your window, it may already be too late. Happy Holidays. There is a dangerous creature that could be anywhere in the world, hiding in plain sight, casually walking through crowded streets filled with people. A monster that is nearly impossible to see, blending into its surroundings almost perfectly. Not invisible, but unnoticeable, almost completely undetectable. But then you spot a familiar outfit in a crowd. You now know where the creature is, but it goes both ways. Since the moment you find it, it knows where you are. There is now not a single place on the earth that you could hide where it wouldn't find you and it won't ever stop looking. To the staff at the Foundation, this creature is known as SCP-4885, but you and I know him by a different name. You may have seen his face hundreds of times, or stared for hours at a page trying to catch a glimpse of him. To us, he's Waldo. While this might feel like a very long-winded and silly joke, maybe even a prank that has been inserted into the SCP archives, it is anything but. If you grew up any time after the late 1980s, then you will likely be familiar with the Where's Waldo books. But for the uninitiated, there are a series of puzzle books created by illustrator Martin Hanford. Each book in the Where's Waldo line contains multiple double-page spreads of colorful, crowded scenes. The goal is for readers to spot the ever-elusive titular character, Waldo, who is hidden among the mass of other characters. Waldo himself is easily recognized, thanks to a design that has become truly iconic over the years. He is always depicted as wearing a red and white striped shirt, with a bobble hat and matching colors. Waldo also sports jeans, circular rimmed glasses, and sometimes a wooden walking stick. So with that important context out of the way up front, what exactly is SCP-4885? Is the character from these children's books somehow brought to life? Has the character of Waldo always been a malicious, malevolent entity too powerful to be contained within his own books? Well, not exactly. SCP-4885 only seems to resemble the famous children's book character. Whether or not he is the living manifestation of Waldo in the real world is both unclear and up for debate. Examining its outward appearance, SCP-4885 does share the humanoid shape and looks to be wearing the same recognizable clothing of Waldo. There are, however, two notable bodily dissimilarities between the Waldo on the page and the physical form of SCP-4885. For one, this Waldo appears to be much paler to the one found in the book series. More noticeably, however, is the fact despite wearing the same circular glasses, SCP-4885 seems to have no eyes. Should a person learn of SCP-4885's current location, Waldo will simultaneously gain an awareness of this person. Learning instantly of their victim's location, SCP-4885 will traverse any space necessary, tracking their target down to anywhere they might be in the world. The creature has displayed a number of space-altering abilities, including teleportation. SCP-4885 can also alter the state of his own matter, allowing Waldo to phase through solid surfaces. 
No obstacle can stop his advance. Not walls, not buildings, not even his victim's own body. When SCP-4885 finally reaches the person who has learned of his location, Waldo will then proceed to murder them in an exceptionally excruciating manner. Using his matter-changing abilities, he will teleport or phase himself inside his victim, pulling himself through their body and destroying their internal organs. After causing catastrophic bodily damage, SCP-4885 will then wrench their victim's jaw open, unhinging it with enough force to climb his way out of their mouth, leaving them dead, their body completely mangled. However, this isn't even the final stage of Waldo's attack. There is a strange byproduct left after a fatal encounter with SCP-4885, a yellow liquid that is produced as Waldo exits his victim's body. When this substance comes into contact with the deceased person's skin, it triggers a bizarre change. The liquid will cause their bodies to change after death, their skin becoming covered in symbols. On closer inspection, it becomes clear that these symbols are illustrations, exactly like the ones found in the pages of Where's Waldo. These corpses, referred to by the Foundation as instances of SCP-4885-1, will then start to act in a similar manner to SCP-4885, and anyone who sees one or learns of its location will cause Waldo to come looking for them. The Where's Waldo scenes left on a deceased victim's skin cannot be washed off or otherwise removed, and the only way to undo an instance of SCP-4885-1 is to skin an infected body after death. However, this creates a whole new problem. If someone was to attempt this, in doing so they would know the location of one of Waldo's victims. This knowledge would mean that whomever was trying to skin one of these bodies would themselves become Waldo's next target, and would likely end up just another instance of SCP-4885-1. In other words, it would be an exercise in futility. Naturally, the nature of visibilities and attack patterns make it difficult for the SCP Foundation to contain Waldo. SCP-4885 cannot be harmed through the use of firearms or other common conventional weapons at the Foundation's disposal. You might be forgiven for thinking that making a handful of people aware of where to find Waldo at the same time would be a viable solution. After all, he cannot be in multiple places at once so perhaps he'd be unable to kill these individuals simultaneously. However, SCP-4885 has shown to be able to cope with this approach, dispatching his victims one at a time, transforming each in turn into Where's Waldo printed corpses before continuing to the next would-be victim. If the victim is nearby, Waldo will force himself into their mouth, passing through their body and destroying bones, organs, and even the spinal column. When his victim is further away, Waldo will phase through the nearest wall and attack them, teleporting into his target and then climbing out of their mouth. Waldo's location or that of his victim's bodies are considered info hazards. Simply being aware of this information will cause SCP-4885 to activate. As a result of this, the staff at the SCP Foundation are not even sure that Waldo is actually contained at all. In theory, SCP-4885 is being held at an undisclosed Foundation site within a non-designed containment chamber, since even a number on the door would tip off what's inside, triggering Waldo's abilities. But here's the clincher, because nobody can know for sure where Waldo is without him coming for them. Nobody at the Foundation actually knows where he's being contained, if he's even contained at all. It is worth noting that, if someone receives a vague, non-specific description of Waldo's whereabouts, that he will make no attempt to seek them out. If he is contained, and if he was to ever breach containment, then the SCP Foundation has an entire set of procedures in place to ensure that no one ever finds Waldo. First, 36 containment chambers identical to the one SCP-4885 is supposedly held in are connected to a self-driving vehicle. An expendable D-Class personnel member is placed into the vehicle and a random number generator will select a number from 1 to 36. The self-driving vehicle will then arrive at the containment chamber chosen at random and the D-Class placed inside. Within each chamber are digital monitors, and once the D-Class is inside the chamber, all of these monitors will display the current location of SCP-4885. The Foundation has kept a GPS tracking device implanted within Waldo, 
but this information is normally kept secret to avoid any containment breaches. The D-Class essentially acts as bait for Waldo, forcibly given the knowledge of his location so that SCP-4885 will consider them a target. As part of the next phase of containment, Foundation staff will wait, giving Waldo enough time to arrive in the containment chamber and dispatch the D-Class within. After this, all of the 36 containment chambers are transported to random Foundation sites in disguised trucks, so that no one is sure where SCP-4885 ends up. Every time SCP-4885 breaches containment, the entire procedure has to be repeated. The Foundation first encountered SCP-4885 a number of years ago, inside a small wooden house, the exact location of which has since been expunged from all the SCP Foundation's records. While on assignment to secure an entirely different anomaly, the Foundation's Mobile Task Force Chai-19, also codenamed Unrelenting Punishment, were the first to discover Waldo. The three-person unit consisted of Foundation operatives named Amelia Merrick, James Klein, and Kurt Stoll. The trio cautiously entered the wooden house where they were meant to investigate reports of an anomalous inanimate object, a pair of black spectacles. According to initial intelligence gathered by the SCP Foundation, these glasses were capable of killing anyone that tried to wear them, leaving their body covered in pictures like those found in the children's book. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It is unknown if these black spectacles are the same eyewear worn by SCP-4885, but it doesn't seem like too far of a leap to assume that this may well have been the case. Searching the ground floor, the team had found no sign of the object they had been sent to recover. As Amelia, Kurt, and James made their way upstairs, something began making scraping sounds beneath them, but none of them noticed. In an abandoned bedroom on the upstairs floor of the house, Kurt spotted a drawing on the wall, which looked to have been made using crayons. He took a photo of the illustration, and this image is still kept in the Foundation's database. It appears to be a child's drawing, depicting SCP-4885 wearing his signature striped shirt and hat with empty, vacant eyes. Next to it was scrawled one simple phrase, Waldo found mommy. Continuing their way through the house, the team located the glasses they were looking for in an upstairs bathroom. However, as James bagged up the spectacles, ready for transport back to the Foundation, Kurt spotted another inscription on a nearby wall, one that the team were certain hadn't been there when they had arrived. James stepped in to translate using the Foundation's standard issue translation device. The phrase on the wall read, The basement. The corpses from a child's book are in the basement. He is there too. Fr and we're sure that you can already guess what happened after that. Immediately after reading these words, James began to groan and clutched at his stomach showing signs of extreme pain. Before Amelia or Kurt had any chance to figure out what was happening to their squad mate, fingers began protruding from James's mouth. They gripped his jaw and pulled it apart with enough force to send his jawbone flying across the room. SCP-4885 climbed its way out of James's body, and Amelia and Kurt both opened fire on the creature. Waldo did not react, seemingly unfazed by the gunfire and sustaining no damage as he approached Amelia who would be his next victim. Shoving his fingers into her throat, Waldo wrenched apart Amelia's jaw, breaking it before he clawed his way into her mouth. As he watched in horror, Kurt made a panicked call for help to the Foundation, but it was too late. Waldo had already dispatched both James and Amelia, and now Kurt was about to pay the same terrible price. Ever since this incident, the Foundation believes that they have SCP-4885 contained. When his file was created, their researchers created an automated algorithm designed to wipe away any mention of SCP-4885's current location or the house he was discovered in from Foundation records. With SCP-4885 now assumed to be contained, that only leaves one question. The same burning inquiry that's been plaguing man for decades. Where's Waldo? In this case, maybe it's safer if you didn't know. You're a pizza delivery person for a company we're not at liberty to name. It may seem like a thankless job, but you're part of the thin crust between satisfaction and starvation for people who really don't feel like cooking or going out tonight. You're a tried and true pizza veteran. You've seen a lot on the job. From people who try to rob you on their own doorsteps, to one guy who tried to tip you with a clearly fake Rolex. 
but you haven't seen anything like the insanity you're about to encounter tonight. That's because you're about to get sick. Really, really sick. And we know there's probably a lot of diseases you'd rather not catch. But trust us, no disease bites quite like SCP-3760. But back to you. You're parked on the saddle of your prized bicycle, pedaling for your life. The biggest order you've ever delivered strapped to the cargo rack behind you. Eight large meat feast pizzas. You figure you're heading towards the most hopping or at least the hungriest party in the city. And despite the frustration of needing to ferry this hot, cheesy nightmare to its destination, parties have historically been pretty good tippers. Little do you know, your prized customer is about to give you much more than just a tip. You pull outside their ground-level apartment and park your bike. There's no music coming from the apartment you're heading to. Strange. You pick up your precious cargo and trudge towards the door, barely managing to ring the bell with your spare pinky. The door swings open instantly, as though the occupant was just standing behind it the whole time, waiting for you. When the door opens, you're not sure what to make of what you see inside. There isn't a party. There doesn't even seem to be a group. Just one person standing there and staring at you. And something about this person is just wrong. His skin seems to be an oddly unnatural color. It has a slightly gray hue, like it's rotting. And you see that the stranger's shirt is torn in several places. You're trying your best to remain professional and not stare. But you notice that whatever is under these tears doesn't look like skin. It's almost like there are holes all over his body underneath the shirt. Big, gaping holes. And are those? You're cut off when he takes the pile of pizzas from you and shoves what was once a handful of dollars into your palm. They seem torn up and worst of all, wet. You look past your strange customer and see that his apartment looks just as shoddy as he does. There's stuffing torn from the couch, huge tears in the curtains what you could swear are scratch or bite marks on some of the wooden furniture. This man clearly needed his pizza. As you begin to step away, happy to just be rid of this freaky situation, you do something that you'll live to regret. Just for a moment, you lock eyes with the customer. There's something about them that makes you feel sick. They're wet and black, more like a doll's eyes than anything that should belong to a human. Just that one instant of contact is enough to chill your bones. And according to some theories around SCP-3760, it may have been the moment of your infection. As the stranger closes the door in your face, presumably to eat his obscene number of pizzas, you stumble back to your bicycle, letting your torn up gooey tip blow away in the wind. Getting out of this place is rewarding enough, but you can't chase the thoughts of the stranger out of your mind. Was he sick? Was he even human? These are the thoughts swimming through your head as you cycle back to the restaurant. You're so preoccupied you don't even notice the truck speeding towards you. You get sideswiped, destroying your bike and throwing you in the air. You can feel the snap of your arm breaking as you land. It's a horrible feeling to go along with the horrible noise. And as you fade from consciousness, the last thought in your mind is the black soulless eyes of the customer. When you wake up you'll find that you're in a hospital bed with your arm in a cast. The doctors tell you that you're phenomenally lucky to be alive given the severity of the crash. The doctor says that you're dealing with a compound fracture in your right arm, as well as some nasty cuts that required stitches, but otherwise, you're fine. The hospital insists that you at least stay the night though, and you oblige. But that night, you find it's difficult to sleep. Partially because of the pain, but mostly because of an extremely strange sound coming from inside the cast around your arm. It's a scraping noise, like something sharp scratching at the interior. You figure it must just be some strange side effect of the pain meds. You're not going to let worry eat you up on the inside. Something else will be doing that soon enough. You're discharged from the hospital the next day and told that you should be fine in a couple of months as though that's some kind of consolation. You try to carry on with your daily life as much as you can with one arm out of commission, but that awful crunching noise from inside your cast persists. You even start to become paranoid that some sort of insect is trapped inside, or worse, a swarm of insects. But you aren't left with that uncertainty for long. By the next morning, your cast has fallen off. Well, not fallen, per se. A more accurate description would be that it was chewed off from the inside. And not by something trapped in there with your arm, but by your arm 
itself. When you finally see it, it doesn't even look like an arm anymore. The flesh has turned gray, that same sickly gray of the customer's skin the night of your accident, but worse still. From the top of the hand down to the base of the forearm, your entire arm is split open into a fang-lined, chattering mouth. When you've gotten over the initial horror of seeing the mutations that have taken hold of your arm, you notice something about the teeth in the second mouth. They're nothing like human teeth. They're vicious, jagged triangles, each one like a dagger. These are unmistakably shark's teeth. You give yourself the luxury of having a good scream. After all, what else are you supposed to do after you find your arm has turned into some kind of fleshy shark mutant? You notice that you can hardly even feel the snapping of its jaws, like it isn't even really a part of you. And as much as you try to tense and release what used to be the tendons in your forearm, there is no change. For all intents and purposes, that limb is no longer yours. It just happens to be attached to you. Not only that, but it's always very, very hungry. As quickly became evident from the fact it made such short work of the cast that had been containing it not long ago. You can see that the graying flesh is beginning to spread from your forearm to your bicep. It's almost like little by little, your tissue is being switched. Somehow you're innately aware that if you don't feed your arm, it'll get even worse. Suddenly, everything about the strange customer from the night of the accident makes sense. He had whatever you have now, only worse. He was just hoping that the pizzas would keep the beast at bay, and you very much hope the contents of your fridge will do the same. Wasting no time, you grab some processed ham and raw chicken. You're not an idiot. You know that if this thing is anything like a real shark, it's only going to be interested in meat. But when you shove the processed meat into the nibbling maw on your forearm, you notice that it seems to spit the food out. Something tells you that your offering was too… dead. Now you're really afraid. Will this thing want life prey? Will that be the only way to stop it from taking the rest of your arm or even more? The thought terrifies you. It's like being Venom, except you don't even get a new alien friend or any cool superpowers for your trouble, but you're smart. You're resourceful. You don't intend to let this thing take over your life without a fight, and you've always believed what G.I. Joe taught you. Knowing is half the battle. Sadly, doing an internet search for, my injury is somehow mutating into a shark, how do I stop this, didn't do much good. And you don't want to go to a doctor, because part of you expects to be immediately shipped off to the nearest circus or military research lab. Instead, you throw on a thick leather jacket that you hope your new shark arm will take a while to eat through, and head to the library of the nearest medical college. If anywhere has sources on the most obscure of medical problems, this would be the place. And after hours of searching through index cards, you find it. What seems to be the one and only source of this ludicrous topic in the thousands and thousands of books. A series of journal entries made by Dr. Keith Woodward, ship's medical officer aboard the USS Kirby, circa 1922. Even the library's indexing system prefaces the source with a disclaimer that it's likely 25% quackery and 75% ocean madness. But that doesn't deter you, and he poured in a storm. Dr. Woodward told the horrifying tale of the USS Kirby's collapse due to a sudden and unexplainable contagion. It began with the infection of a sailor on the ship named Willis Riggs, who'd fallen overboard and had his foot partially eaten by a shark. Much like your arm, the man's foot slowly became the ravenous, all-devouring mouth of a shark itself. Little by little, it spread to the other crew members through unknown means. Any injury sustained by the crew didn't heal like normal, but instead became this vicious, living shark tissue. Soon, these ever-hungry new mouths led them to eat each other, and then, themselves from the inside out. Even after the humans they once were could be considered long dead, those hungry jaws kept snapping. There was no cure. There was no solution. Everyone on the boat was recorded as having mysteriously died at sea. That is the curse of SCP-3760. And as if on cue, you look down to see that the shark's mouth in your arm has chewed through the leather of your sleeve like it's nothing. It's hungry and nothing will satiate it. But perhaps some sacrifices need to be made if you want to stop it from getting worse. Just as the thought crosses your mind, a needle full of sedative is injected into your neck. Everything goes dark very quickly, and when you wake up, you're in a clean, clinical white room. You are now officially under containment by the SCP Foundation. Not that you'll know that anytime soon. This may seem like the Calvary has arrived, 
but sadly for your sake, they have no interest in curing you. They're just eager to gather more data on how your condition progresses. SCP-3760 exists as a latent infection in well over half of humanity, but its horrific mutating effects are activated in only a relative few. There have only been 2,785 recorded cases of SCP-3760 activity observed between 1958 and 2016. This is thanks to the Foundation's secret weapon against the shark mutation menace, Subliminal Mimetic Agent Kappa Omicron, or SMAKO, a widely distributed mimetic agent that suppresses the symptoms of infection in most people. Not that this would provide much comfort to you, as you join the almost 3,000 others who have been infected, and you are doomed to slowly turn into an abomination in your containment chamber. If it's any consolation, you may not see the truly advanced stages of the disease. The most common cause of death among the afflicted is being eaten by their own ravenous shark mouths long before it changes your entire body. Actually, come to think of it, that's not much of a consolation at all. But hey, when it comes to anomalous mutations, we're sad to report that there's rarely a happy ending in store for those afflicted, and SCP-3760 is no exception to the rule. Why do so many of the indigenous cultures of the colder regions of North America seem to share the same legend? A legend that tells of a monster that lurks in the forests, bringing cold and death to any that meet it. This creature is an omen of famine, a territorial beast that preys on human beings. Some cultures describe it as an unholy abomination, a spirit of winter and a warning against the dangers of selfishness, one that is created whenever a person resorts to cannibalism in order to survive. It will gladly devour any man, woman, or child that wanders into its territory, holding a horrifying and insatiable hunger for human flesh. So how did so many cultures end up with the same story? Could it be because it's real? Depictions of the beast vary, but it is most commonly recognized by its tall skeletal form, like a body exhumed from the grave, even carrying the stench of death and decay with it. Anyone who encounters one risks being eaten or transformed into a creature just like it. The monster's name means an evil spirit that devours mankind, though to even say the name is taboo, as it's believed to give power to the beast. Of course, these are all just legends, right? Stories to warn against the dangers of greed and selfishness, but otherwise nothing to fear. There's no proof that such a beast could actually be roaming the frozen wastes. Many at the SCP Foundation felt the same way, until they heard about SCP-323, hmm. the Wendigo's skull. Kept under lock and key by the Foundation with around-the-clock surveillance, SCP-323 is an anomalous object with ties to the various Wendigo legends. As the object's moniker suggests, SCP-323 is a skull. Not a human skull, mind you. It more closely resembles a cervid skull. Cervids are a family of mammals that include most varieties of deer, elk, and other similar animals, and this particular cervid skull sports a tall pair of antlers. SCP-323 is definitely not a fresh skull either. It shows signs of weathering and a few scars across the surface, looking as if the bone has been bleached and eroded through exposure to the elements. The skull is also missing its lower jaw, and has a sizable hole on the rear underside that may have been carved using stone tools. SCP-323 is kept restrained inside an armored container within a concrete containment cell, and personnel are only ever allowed near it to check the restraints for signs of damage. Additionally, any Foundation staff that enter SCP-323 cell must be accompanied by an armed security officer, and in the event of a containment breach, the entire site is to be evacuated. Seems like a lot of precautions and safety measures for an old piece of bone. Surely a harmless deer skull could never be that dangerous, right? <gasps> Wrong. You might be forgiven for thinking that a skull can't possibly cause harm. After all, SCP-323 is just a skull, then whatever animal it belonged to is dead. But this skull is far more than it appears to be. Through extensive testing, the SCP Foundation's researchers have learned that the skull isn't dead. No, this skull is awake and aware. It can see, hear, and has a sense of touch, and it can and will react to various stimuli. However, this does not necessarily mean that SCP-323 is alive or even sentient. 
but it definitely appears to have some level of sapience. It will target certain members of personnel that get too close, and has attempted multiple times to breach containment. It also reacts violently to anyone speaking English or French near it. The only two languages prohibited inside SCP-323's cell. So while the skull is not technically alive, it is definitely aware. Still, why the need for so many protocols to keep it contained? It's not as if a skull can just walk off on its own. Of course not. But SCP-323 can move, at least to a certain degree. Often in a reactionary manner, SCP-323 will vibrate or move on its own. For example, turning to watch as personnel enter its containment cell. In most cases, these movements are tiny and insignificant, but other times the skull lunges, launching itself at Foundation personnel as it desperately tries to get free. Now you know why it's kept restrained. So, we have an antlered cervid skull that can move and has a low level of awareness. On their own, these would be more than enough to warrant the Foundation's interest, but the anomalous properties of SCP-323 don't stop there. The Skull has an inherent ability to influence the minds of those around it. Anyone spending an hour within a 15-meter radius of SCP-323 is likely to experience the effects of this influential power. This will often result in them exhibiting uncharacteristic behaviors, thoughts, and urges, including cannibalistic tendencies and outbursts of random violence. Almost three-quarters of people that suffer the influence of SCP-323 will feel an overwhelming compulsion to take the Wendigo skull and fit their heads into the chiseled hole on the rear underside. If someone attempting this finds that their head is too big to fit inside the hollow skull, there have been cases of individuals trying to bludgeon their heads on any hard surface they can find nearby in an attempt to get their head down to a more manageable size. This will continue until one of three outcomes occurs. One, the person manages to fit their head into the skull. Two, they cause themselves so much cranial damage that they are rendered unconscious. Or three, they end up killing themselves through repeated violent head trauma. Of course, if a person actually manages to fit their head inside SCP-323, then that is a different story entirely. In these instances, the individual becomes classified as an instance of SCP-323-1. Within 10 minutes of wearing the skull, this person will suffer dramatic changes to their body. Any and all body fat will be rapidly shed as their hair also begins to fall out, leaving them looking starved and almost skeletal in appearance. Their distal phalanges, those are the bones at the tip of the fingers, will elongate and rupture the skin as they become bony, claw-like appendages. The subject will also find that their teeth have grown abnormally long and sharp, while their limbs will blacken as if they were suffering frostbite symptoms. Along with their external transformations, SCP-323-1 will also get increased strength and heightened resistance to pain. They aren't invulnerable, though, and can still sustain damage and injuries. SCP-323 will also have a dramatic change happen to their metabolism which will occur a few minutes into the physical transformation. The subject will now need an almost constant intake of calories, which, if they don't receive, will cause them to starve almost instantly. With the transformation process complete, the new instance of SCP-323-1 has finally become the Wendigo, a terrifying monster with one goal to feed. The SCP-323 instance will seek out any human beings it can find so that it can feed upon their flesh. Those who have witnessed the 323 instance in the midst of a feeding frenzy have described the way it violently slaughtered any person it could find, leaving only a mess of blood as it devoured them their screams mixed in with the sounds of bones crunching. In the times that the creature cannot find a human to nourish its monstrous appetite, it will try to keep itself alive any way it can. Sometimes it will slow down its movement to try and conserve energy. Other times it will ration whatever food is available to it, saving some of its last meal for a leftover snack. And on occasion, the monster will engage in auto-cannibalism, a form of cannibalism that involves eating parts of itself. Humans certainly seem to be its preferred food source, though. 
Even when other sources of meat would be easier to acquire, SCP-323-1 will zero in on human beings and will do anything it can to make a person its next meal. When chasing down its prey, human or otherwise, SCP-323-1 has been observed uttering phrases either spoken in the primary language of whoever was transformed by the skull, or in the Severn, Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Cree languages. These are all native languages of the numerous indigenous creatures that shared legends of the Wendigo. Where do the phrases come from, though? Are they another side effect of SCP-323's influence? Or do they originate from the skull itself? The Foundation's researchers are still trying to figure that out, and at the moment, they have no clues as to where they come from. In one containment breach in 2006, during which an instance of SCP-323-1 was able to kill and devour 12 members of Foundation personnel, on-site surveillance recorded audio of the creature speaking. It rasped, while dragging a body behind it. After this, the sound of a wet cracking noise was recorded, possibly one of the victim's bones being broken by SCP-323-1 so it could get to the marrow inside. The 323-1 instance does at times seem to try and resist the influence of the Wendigo skull. Additional recordings capture the creature saying, The creature then said, followed by noises of it eating the body. It seems that even the Wendigo has its own internal struggles, perhaps showing that there is still something left of the human who put on the skull, and that deep down they are fighting against their cannibalistic impulses. But where exactly did the Foundation find SCP-323? And is it really the skull of an actual Wendigo? the famous creature from North American legend. In 1997, the SCP Foundation sent a detachment to Bitterin Lake in Saskatchewan, Canada. There had been reports of a local community murdering individuals and leaving their bodies in the forest to appease a dangerous creature residing nearby. This creature, as it was later discovered, was an instance of SCP-323-1. Someone had found the skull and succumbed to its influence placing it on their head and turning into a monster. Ever since, the locals had been killing people and offering up their dead bodies as sustenance, fearful of what would happen if they didn't, after being brought up with legends of the Wendigo. SCP Foundation agents were able to capture the beast, however it died of starvation while being transported back to containment. They also covered up the recent deaths in the area by giving the local residents amnestics and creating a cover story about an unidentified serial killer. Killer. Prior to this, James Namagoose, a local man who was involved in the murders, was brought in for questioning. He remained oddly calm when interviewed, but admitted he had helped move the bodies that were being offered up as food for SCP-323-1, or as he called it, the Wendigo. According to James, a local story among the Cree people told of men who had once tried to control a Wendigo, and perhaps even tame it through offerings of food. Whether or not James and his fellow locals had the same intention, their primary concern was keeping themselves safe. He described first encountering the creature, a warped man walking out of the woods, killed our friends right in front of us. Sometimes it would stare more than it would make to kill, try to talk to you. It whispered at me, Pemisto, come and eat. It made me cold in my bones. As the interview continued, James claimed that he felt like he understood this warped man. He described feeling like the Wendigo was encouraging him to kill, that the creature would help him pass when his own time came. 
James told the Foundation doctor questioning him that he had heard the creature in his mind, and he felt it watching him almost constantly. Mr. Namagu stated that he hoped in killing people as offerings to the Wendigo, that his own family would be spared. Like the other locals, James Namagus was given amnestics to forget all about the creature and the murders he'd played a part in committing. So far, none of the Foundation staff had experienced any similar behavioral effects to those James described. Those who work closely with SCP-323 or have witnessed an instance of SCP-323-1 have felt the creature communicating with them, or urging them to kill on its behalf. Ultimately, who is to say if SCP-323 is the skull of a Wendigo like those from Legend? It certainly seems like it is, but with no way to tell exactly how old the skull is, perhaps it's actually the reverse, and it was the Wendigo legend that spawned from instances of SCP-323-1 that were first encountered by indigenous North American cultures hundreds of years ago. One thing is for certain, if you ever come across a skull with tall antlers, you should try to resist putting it on. Otherwise, you might not be feeling like yourself for much longer. It was the summer of 2012 in Damascus, and for the people of Syria, it certainly seemed like all the predictions about the end of the world were coming true. The Syrian civil war was raging between multiple rebel groups, and the dictator Bashar al-Assad, whose government was shelling its own people, as well as using chemical weapons and brutal campaigns of violence across the country in hopes of quelling the rebellion. Little did they know, amidst all this pain and bloodshed, something even more dangerous was brewing. An anomalous phenomenon in the sunny plains north of Damascus that may pose a threat to all of humanity someday. A threat known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-3989, the Bone Orchard. This temporal and spatial anomaly was discovered a few years earlier in 2009, before the Syrian civil war even officially began. It's strange for a highly dangerous Keter-class anomaly to be discovered under such seemingly mundane circumstances. The SCP Foundation first became aware of SCP-3989 after a small olive orchard owner sold a strangely high amount of olives that shouldn't have been possible when compared to his reported number of Olea Europea olive trees. Field agents were dispatched to question the owner about his sudden success but he was resistant to questioning. The agents began a covert surveillance operation to figure out what was actually going on here, at which point they discovered a considerable spatial anomaly. The olive orchard was far bigger on the inside. The property was seized by the foundation for containment. The owner had no real knowledge of the spatial anomaly. It's likely he just decided not to look a gift horse in the mouth while making money hand over fist from the extra olives he sold. The owner was given amnestics and a new life, as the Foundation began to study this anomaly, which was now labeled SCP-3989. To this day, no researcher has been able to figure out the origin of 3989's anomalous qualities. It was first given a Euclid-class designation and cordoned off from the public with a simple chain-link fence while Foundation investigations were underway on the inside. On a map, the plot of land the Olive Farm should occupy is about five square acres, but this plot contains an unseen portal to a pocket dimension within its 12-meter active zone, which doesn't follow the same spatial laws that our reality does. This subdimension, known as SCP-3989-A, is a hotbed of fascinating anomalous activity. Upon discovery of this hot zone, the Foundation established the nearby Area 126 as a research center and a makeshift containment facility for any anomalous entities captured from SCP-3989-A. It seemed like the Foundation really had a handle on this situation, but they were blissfully unaware of the true horrors lurking within SCP-3989-A. But they'd soon find out in the most horrifying way possible. Dr. Farah Kazeli was assigned to head the research into the anomalous zone within 3989, and naturally, he began organizing fact-finding expeditions into the heart of the affected area. The first guinea pig to head into the hot zone was former Foundation agent Hosea Herrick, who'd been demoted to the lowly D-class position of D-126-15 due to failures on a previous mission. With a remote link to Dr. Gazelli, Herrick was forced to venture into the active anomalous zone to collect footage and samples of the flora and fauna within. The first thing Herrick noticed on his expedition was the strange quality of the olive trees within the active zone. 
The bark was a stark white, and the leaves a bloody red. Up close, Herrick could see that the trunks and branches of the trees had undergone a process known as ossification, where the material slowly becomes bone or bone-like tissue. Hence the anomaly's creepy name, the Bone Orchard. These ossified trees became known as SCP-3989-1. Herrick also made another discovery. All over the trees and ground were worm-like creatures that looked like long maggots that the Foundation dubbed SCP-3989-1A. Agent Herrick then noticed something was off about the leaves of the ossified trees. They were beating. He looked closer and they appeared to be heart tissue filled with pumping veins. Dr. Gazelli ordered Herrick to take a branch for testing, and when he did, the tree began to bleed. When he looked down, he saw that the worm-like creatures that covered the ground were now crawling up his legs. Ignoring orders from Dr. Gazelli, Herrick fled from the active zone in terror. As he left, Dr. Gazelli caught something in the corner of Herrick's body cam footage, a long white hind limb disappearing behind a tree. Back in our normal dimension, Tests on the sample Herrick collected yielded more upsetting discoveries. Genetically, the trees were identical to humans, the trunks were human bone, and the leaves really were made of human heart tissue. Fascinated and just a little bit horrified, Dr. Gazelli authorized further expeditions into 3989-A. This time, though, Agent Herrick would be accompanied by another D-Class, and both would be armed with handguns and protective body armor. As it would turn out, this expedition would be even more horrifying than the first. As the two D-Classes explored the active zones to collect further samples, they found that the worms were responsible for the ossification of the otherwise non-anomalous olive trees. They consumed the wood little by little and deposited human bone matter in return. Herrick and his companion also noticed that these trees were beginning to bear fruit. Dr. Gazelli ordered Herrick to collect some of this fruit for testing, but when they attempted to remove the fruit, it burst, releasing more worm creatures. It seemed that the converted trees acted as incubators for their egg sacs. Before the duo could return with the samples they were able to take, the creature that had been spotted on Herrick's body cam during the first mission finally appeared. It was huge, with long white limbs, and no facial features except for a huge mouth. It grabbed Herrick's companion and literally ate the top half of his body in a single bite before dropping his legs to the ground. This horrifying beast, and the many others like it, would later be designated as SCP-3989-2A. Herrick pulled out his sidearm and shot the creature several times. The creature ignored the bullets, though, and charged Herrick. The feed from his body cam cut out soon after. Both men were declared killed in action, and in recognition of his sacrifice, Josiah Herrick was posthumously reinstated to his old position in the Foundation. Job well done, Agent. Dr. Gazelli, meanwhile, prepared for the next mission. This time knowing of the clear dangers present within the Bone Orchard, Dr. Gazelli recruited the help of MTF Zeta-9, aka the Mole Rats. Three members, referred to as Charlie Team, were sent into the anomalous zone, once again remotely directed by Dr. Gazelli. They were equipped with experimental ultrasound technology, so they could scan the fruit of the trees within 3989-A without breaking any and incurring the wrath of 3989-2A, which seemed to act as sentries for the trees. Early on in their journey, they found the body of Agent Herrick crucified against one of the ossified trees, his skin covered in mysterious symbols that were likely of Sarkic origin. While we don't have time to fully explore Sarkicism, that will require a video explanation all of its own. All you need to know is that it's a dangerous religious cult that worships flesh and disease and has close ties to similar dangerous anomalies, like SCP-610, also known as the flesh that hates. People familiar with that SCP will note eerily strange similarities to some of the things the mole rats were about to encounter. As Charlie team explored, they saw a huge number of 3989-2As observing them with eyeless faces from between the ossified trees. They pressed on, until they discovered what seemed to be an entirely new kind of tree within the bone orchard. SCP-3989-2 were huge trees made out of what appears to be enlarged human spines in place of a trunk. The smaller twigs on the tree were made from heart and lung tissue, 
and the whole thing was covered in what appeared to be human amniotic sacs. Charlie team attempted to use their ultrasound scanners to discover the contents of these sacs, but one of them exploded in the process, releasing an entirely new variety of monster. From the sacs emerged the larval stage of SCP-3989-2B, smaller humanoid monsters with no faces, no sensory organs, two pelvises, four legs, and an exposed spine. Suddenly, Charlie team could feel a horrifying psychic presence around them, which one member of the team described as being like someone grabbing her liver and giggling in her face. As the various monsters of the Bone Orchard began to converge on the team, the voice of the Sarkic prophet of war and the hunt, Oruk, began sounding in their ears. He was beckoning them to join him. While Charlie team fled from the active zone, Dr. Gazelli felt increasingly drawn into it. He heard the voice of Oruk, and he liked what he heard. Little by little, the workers of Area 126 were losing their minds, manipulated by the sarcic power of the Bone Orchard right next to them, day after day. They were no longer loyal to the Foundation. They wanted to serve their new Dark Masters. The fourth and final expedition was led by Dr. Gazelli himself. He took a band of loyal followers and one non-believer on a quest into the active zone to find an Orkian temple they believed was hidden in the very heart of the Bone Orchard. Once they were inside, Gazelli and his loyalists murdered the non-believer as a sacrifice to their new master. They carried on until they eventually found what they were looking for. A giant stone temple resembling an Aztec ziggurat, dubbed SCP-3989-4. There they also encountered a new kind of monster, dubbed SCP-3989-3. These beasts were larger than the others, and resembled ancient warriors. They had insect-like exoskeletal armor, horned heads, additional hind and forelimbs, and integrated bladed weapons. What Dr. Gazelli and his companions thought would be paradise turned out to be a kind of hell as they were led into the temple, where temporal and spatial distortions broke their mind, and the multiple highly aggressive instances of SCP-3989-3, Dash 2A and Dash 2B broke their bodies. The whole thing had been a horrifying trap. In that moment, back at Area 126, another fleshy, horrifying tree sprouted out of the ground in the middle of the complex. Monsters that had once been Dr. Gazelli and his followers emerged from its amniotic sacs, and all hell broke loose throughout the complex. Soon enough, the base was crawling with monsters from the Bone Orchard and staff who'd become brainwashed Sarkic cultists working in service of Oruk. Humans were gathered up to be sacrificed to the ever-growing number of anomalous trees. Things came to a head when the anomaly in Area 126 was visited by an outside agent from the Foundation working on behalf of the Hazardous Materials Containment Liaison. Biological containment specialist Dr. Marshall Grant and his team arrived at the site and were horrified to see the sarcic nightmare that had unfolded. They quickly engaged in a firefight with the anomalous creatures and sarcic devotees who'd gained control over Area 126. A number of Dr. Grant's team were lost in the process, but thankfully, they were able to eventually regain control of the base and the anomalous area. After this incident, SCP-3989 was upgraded to Keter class and given a huge upgrade in security, including four meter high concrete walls and a platoon sized regimen of mobile task force members with heavy weaponry. The force that took over the minds of those exposed was designated SCP-3989-5, a force so powerful that those infected are given the choice to self-terminate or be contained forever. This may seem like a somewhat happy ending to a grim tale, but one detail keeps Dr. Grant and everyone at the Foundation who is forced to deal with 3989 awake at night. According to all recent studies into the Bone Orchard, it isn't contained at all. In fact, the active zone is getting bigger. Disturbing things had been happening on the fifth floor of the Rose Heights apartment building in Albany, New York. Residents had reported strange noises over the last few days, screaming in the night, pained muttering, soft weeping, scratching and scuttling in the walls, and worst of all, what seemed like an infestation of bugs unlike anything the unfortunate occupants of Rose Heights had ever seen before. They weren't abnormal in size or shape, 
They looked an awful lot like the common earwig, around two and a half centimeters long with large curved pinchers on the back. But the color wasn't right. Unlike the usual dark brown, these earwigs were a silverly, almost translucent gray. When people spotted them crawling across their walls or hiding in the carpet, they seemed to shimmer in the light. Eventually, the building's landlady, Donna Tompkins, was called in to do something about the infestation. She spoke to each of the residents about their experience. They reported the strange noises, the mysterious bugs, and even a funny smell they'd sometimes catch in the hall. A smell like someone had thrown up. And every single person that Donna spoke to couldn't help but remark that the smell was particularly strong outside the apartment of a certain resident, Bill Parham. Stranger still was the fact that Bill hadn't been seen in days. Donna knocked on his door, but received no answer. She called him on his cell phone and could hear the phone ringing inside the apartment, but it just went to voicemail. When she checked the security footage of the lobby, she saw that Bill hadn't left the building in the last few days either. Donna called the police, worried that Bill might be sick or even dead inside his apartment. It was strange, given that he was only in his 30s and didn't seem to have any health conditions. But stranger things had happened. Much stranger things were about to happen too. Two police officers arrived not long after. They called through the door one more time, and when they got no response, Donna gave them the key to head inside. The apartment was a wreck. All the furniture was covered in dust. Filthy dishes were piled high in the sink and on the draining board. The smell of rot was thick in the air. There were empty boxes of painkillers. All the pills popped from their silvery foil laying on the ground. But worst of all were the bugs. The apartment was crawling with them, and they were on every surface. Those silvery gray earwigs. Neither of the officers liked bugs, and it seemed like the deeper they got into the apartment, the more bugs there were. Some even seemed to be crawling towards them, pointing their pinchers at them as though they were defending their territory. This looked to be a textbook case of what happens when a resident keels over and dies. But there was just one problem. Where was the body? Bill Parham had seemingly dropped off the face of the earth, and now a colony of mysterious bugs had started squatting in his apartment in his absence. Then came that smell again. That truly awful smell like bile and blood. It was even stronger now, and it seemed like it was coming from a nearby closet. The two officers acting on pure instinct drew their weapons and approached the closet with caution. Even if they weren't consciously aware of it, they knew they were going to find something awful inside. Something evil. Something dangerous. When they threw open the closet door, they couldn't help but scream. They'd found the nest. It was a huge round hive, like the biggest beehive you've ever seen melded into the lower corner of the closet. The unnatural earwigs were crawling into, out of, and around it. Thousands of them. Tens of thousands of them. And the second they registered the presence of the two officers, intruders into their nest, they began to swarm. In sheer panic, both raised their guns and opened fire into the closet, but it didn't do them any good. Their bullets just pierced and splintered the hive, causing even more enraged insects to spill out and begin crawling over the two cops. They fled from the apartment, screaming in pain from the gnashing pincers of the insects crawling all over their skin. They never did find the corpse of Bill Parham. But that's because Bill Parham wasn't dead. At least not until mere moments ago, when the bullets from the cops' gun had torn through his bones and perforated his organs. He died not long after, and if he could still speak close to the end, he would have thanked them both for the mercy. Because the monstrosity that they'd just encountered in the closet wasn't just a nest of mysterious insects in Bill Parham's apartment, it was Bill himself. This is the fate worse than death in store for anyone supremely unlucky enough to fall victim to SCP-439, better known by the nickname for their unique nests, the Bone Hive. And while these nasty little critters may be small, they're filled with enough pure nightmare fuel to send you running into 682's containment chamber for a little comfort. Let's go through this whole nightmarish process and tell you exactly what happened to poor Bill Parham. 
First discovered by the SCP Foundation in mainland China, SCP-439 specimens largely get by on the fact that they're not much to look at. Unless you're an entomologist, when you see a strange insect, you probably just accept the fact that it's a perfectly normal breed you've just never encountered before. Nobody is hammering down the doors of their local news station to alert the press about the gray earwig they saw crawling out of a crack in their bathroom wall. But if Bill Parham had done just that, it would have saved his life. The Foundation would have immediately flagged the incident as an SCP-439 infestation and dispatched a mobile task force to deal with it. Instead, when Bill saw the earwig for the first time, he was getting ready for work and didn't have the time to stop and deal with it. He made a mental note to buy some bug killer on the way home, but quickly forgot. The insect didn't forget him, though. In fact, it thought he would be a perfect candidate for the SCP-439 process. The Foundation has tested extensively with the one SCP-439 sample they'd been able to successfully catch and contain. In all tests, they found that 439 specimens rejected hosts from any species other than humans. They're an extraordinarily specific parasite. It's also only one particular type of SCP-439 specimen that you actually need to worry about. The Queens Despite their superficial similarities, SCP-439 behave nothing like non-anomalous earwigs. Normal earwigs are not social creatures. They're solitary scavengers and they don't keep nests as permanent habitats. The same can definitely not be said for SCP-439. They have complex social structures, much like that of bees, ants, and termites, with queens, scouts, workers, and warriors. If you happen to encounter a worker or a warrior, you may get a painful pinch from their pinchers if you get too close. But if you end up on the wrong side of one of the queens, then you have a much, much worse fate in store for you. And it just so happened that the SCP-439 specimen that appeared in Bill Parham's bathroom that morning was visiting royalty. This 439 queen had selected her target. And now, it was time to move to the next part of the process. Initial Infiltration When Bill returned home from work, he was delighted to find that the gray earwig was nowhere to be seen. But that didn't mean it was gone. It was still there lurking. It just didn't want to be seen. After all, the real fun would happen after Bill went to bed. Once SCP-439 detects that its potential host has fallen into a deep sleep, it will crawl onto the person's body and into their mouth, which is exactly what it did to Bill. It feels like little more than a tickle in your throat, and you will have no idea that the tiny creature crawling down your windpipe and into the soft, warm tissue of your lungs spells your doom. Very few people wake up during this process, but even if they did, there's virtually nothing they could do. When Bill woke up, he was suffering from mild chest pains and shortness of breath, a symptom not uncommon in a number of respiratory ailments. He had no idea that the SCP-439 queen was already inside him. He got up and went about his day, trying to ignore the pain as it gradually grew worse and worse, feeling almost like something was moving inside his chest. He spent the whole day having to stop to let out a deep, hacking cough, but coughing didn't expel or change anything. He looked and felt so terrible that his boss let him go home early, hoping that Bill would be able to sleep off whatever illness he thought he had picked up. But over the next couple of days, his condition only worsened. The pain grew so excruciating he could barely move, and he was popping painkillers like Tic Tacs to no effect. He started running a dangerously high fever, his body trying in vain to fight back against its lethal intruder. He felt worse than he ever had in his life, but little did poor Bill know, the most terrible parts of the process were yet to come. Through anomalous means, an SCP-439 infection is able to induce fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, or FOP in its victims, which is typically a genetic disease that presents itself before the victim turns 10 years old. The condition is infamous for its primary symptom, turning muscle and other soft tissue into bone, slowly but surely paralyzing the victim and putting them into a state of unspeakable pain. This bone transformation process is known as ossification, and Bill was about to experience it firsthand. His pain increased as his mobility decreased, with more of his flesh becoming solid lumps of bone underneath the skin. Soon enough, all he knew was pain. It became so agonizing that he was delirious with it. 
He was drunk on pain. Even perceiving sunlight felt like being stabbed in the eyes. That's why, like all the other victims of SCP-439, he decided to conceal himself in a warm, dark place where no light could get to him. In Bill's case, of course, that place was his closet. He was hurting so bad that all he could do was curl up into the fetal position and weep as his muscles turned to bone and his body began to compact and shrink. He didn't even look like a human anymore. He was more like a ball, covered in a bone shell and filled with warm organs. That's when the queen started laying eggs among his organs. It wasn't long before there was a new brood of around 30,000 specimens living inside Bill's body. He was still very much alive, but there wasn't anything he could do about his situation. His muscles had long since turned to bone, and they had eaten large portions of his brain, leaving mainly the parts needed to keep his organs just barely functioning. After all, the colony still needs central heating. SCP-439 colonies have developed a perfect parasitic relationship with the human body. They even use the stomach inside the hive to pre-digest food into a liquid slurry that's easier for them to consume. The only loser in this situation is someone like Bill, who is forced to become the new home for the world's most nightmarish freeloaders. Eventually, when the colony becomes too big, a queen departs to start a new one, and the process repeats itself once more. It's enough to make you want to sleep with your mouth closed for the rest of your life. Oh, and we haven't even told you the worst part yet. Foundation scientists have conducted tests on some victims of SCP-439 and found that while the creatures do consume large parts of the brain, the parts they leave are capable of consciousness. That's right. Their victims remain aware of what's happening to them the whole time, even when they hardly seem human at all anymore. What actually finally kills the victims of SCP-439 isn't the bodily trauma. It's the starvation that sets in when the colony inevitably moves on. Did we just hear you cough? You might want to go get that checked out. A woman walks through the lonely hills in the dead of night. Her purple sari is torn and filthy from days of exposure to the elements. Her bare feet have been cut up and bruised by the rough terrain she walks, but her clothes and feet are not the most noticeable thing about her. This woman is pregnant, her belly swollen to freakish proportions. It's frankly a miracle that she's even able to walk in this state. She stumbles and sways under the weight of the thing growing inside her. Whatever it is, it's too large to be any kind of ordinary baby. But she keeps moving, muttering to herself in a language that no human ear has heard in years. Her eyes are glazed over, almost hypnotized. She moves with great purpose, but her vacant facial expression makes it appear as though she doesn't know exactly what that purpose is. She just needs to keep moving further into the wilderness until it happens, whatever it is. The one thing that's certain is that it isn't anything good. A car rumbles down a nearby dirt road. It's being driven by Dr. Vinay Ramachadran, a medical practitioner from the nearby city of Surat who occasionally drives out to the more rural areas where the locals might not have easy access to medical help. He spots the staggering woman and immediately pumps the brakes of his car. She's clearly in need of medical attention. Thank goodness he happened to be driving by at the time. Dr. Ramachadran grabs his medical bag from the back seat and rushes towards the woman, who collapses in a heap before he reaches her. That's when, to his utter horror, Dr. Ramachadran notices that the woman's belly is continuing to swell at an unnatural rate. Even for a woman who is heavily pregnant with triplets, this would still be far too large, and the rate at which she's swelling is akin to someone blowing up a balloon. By the time Dr. Ramachadran reaches her, the worst has already happened. The woman's belly has burst open, and crouching on her corpse is the thing that was growing inside her, an adult man nude and covered in blood. Dr. Ramachadran's terror only increases when he notices that the man is eating her. Elsewhere, a riot is unfolding in the streets. A megaphone-wielding instigator barks orders for violence and chaos as the rioters spread, setting fires, smashing windows, and attacking any unfortunate civilians caught in their way. It's one of the worst riots that the area has ever seen. Even the veteran riot cops are frightened by the ferocity of it. The cops descend and clash with the crowd of ever-advancing rioters. They're beaten back with crowbars, baseball bats, knives, and metal pipes. And behind them all 
The instigator continues spitting his venomous words, working the crowd into an unmatchable frenzy. They'll need heavy reinforcements if they want to get this riot under control. That's when one of the riot cops on the front line, Sergeant Abhishek, notices something strange. So many of the rioters seem to have the exact same face, the face of the instigator. Another place, another time, four men are digging up a grave in a desolate old graveyard. They work tirelessly, all moving in perfect synchronicity. They're only interrupted when a group of heavily armed men crash the party and start firing on them. But these grave robbers are prepared. All of them draw revolvers like a gang in an old western and begin returning fire, causing the men in tactical gear to seek cover behind the nearby tombstones. While one of the grave robbers continues to fire, the other three scatter during the confusion. When his gun runs dry with that telltale click, the men in tactical gear immediately rise up and pincushion him with shot after shot of their assault rifles. He does the bullet dance like Tony Montana and collapses to the ground. But when the gunmen approach to confirm the kill, there's a horrifying twist of fate. Swarms of horrible red flies start pouring out of every bullet wound, swarming the attackers who retreat swatting away these horrible little insects. But there's so many of them, there's no way to stop at least some of them from crawling into their mouths. Here's an interesting fact. All of these nightmarish incidents are connected. In the year 1969, a mysterious man was arrested in Himatnagar, an area in the Indian state of Gujarat. This man had been accused of inciting civil unrest, terrorizing and distressing the local people. He was later extradited to an unknown location after the Indian authorities received a request from a mysterious organization known as, yep, you guessed it, the SCP Foundation. Who could this man have possibly been to attract such attention? The authorities thought it best not to question it. They were probably just glad to be rid of the troublemaker once and for all. Except they weren't, not by a long shot. A few years later in 1975, a group of four men were discovered in a cemetery, this time in Ahmedabad another location in Gujarat, India, for desecrating graves. This would be strange and upsetting enough, but what really sent things to the next level of weirdness was the discovery that these four men were all the same man. Each one was not only genetically identical to one another, but also to the man that had been extradited in 1969. You'd be more than justified in asking, what the hell is going on here? Maybe they were just a group of highly rare quintuplets, Five children all born from the same mother, who just happened to have a predilection towards crime and antisocial behavior, or perhaps something stranger was afoot. The four who appeared in the cemetery might have been clones of the original troublemaker in Himnathagar. As relatively simple as those explanations would be, the truth was in fact far, far weirder than mad science or coincidentally criminal quintuplets. The four from the cemetery had been ambushed by operatives of the Global Occult Coalition, another shadowy organization fans of this channel are likely to recognize. The Coalition, or GOC, is a group that views itself as the police of the paranormal world, using extremely advanced technology to destroy supernatural entities and artifacts rather than contain them. They've been known to work both alongside and against the SCP Foundation. Both groups combined interest in four genetically identical men in an Indian graveyard seemed to suggest that there was something supernatural about their origin. One of the men had been killed by the GOC, while the remaining three were taken into custody by the SCP Foundation. Gotta love the power of teamwork. But who were these men? Where had they come from, and why did they share identical genes to the first man from six years earlier? Could there have been even more of them? Well, in the years following, the Foundation has been able to determine that, yes, there are more of these genetically identical individuals out there. Across the more rural states of India, like Gujarat, Rajasthan, Himachal Pradesh, Haryana, Punjab, Jammu, and Kashmir, there may be over a thousand instances of the same person. Collectively, they are known as SCP-2833. While their outward appearance can vary somewhat, instances of SCP-2833 all share the exact same genetic traits as each other. Depending on the area they are located in, these anomalous people can speak various languages and regional dialects, including Hindi, English, Gujarati, Dogiri, Kashmiri, Punjabi, Urdu, and even an outdated unknown language that doesn't correspond with any known modern dialect or language family. 
Each SCP-2833 also possesses the ability to manipulate the organic matter of their own body. Now, we don't mean that these men will stretch themselves like Mr. Fantastic, or turn into something out of John Carpenter's The Thing, but they're able to use their bodies to create... well... something. SCP-2833 instances can produce a small anomalous parasite known as SCP-2833-A. These are often released through any bodily orifice like the mouth, nose, or ears, or through any cuts or open wounds suffered by an SCP-2833. In other words, if you shot and killed an SCP-2833, perhaps in a cemetery under the orders of the Global Codes Coalition, then these parasites would still be able to escape through the victim's bullet wounds. The only way to stop this from happening is to incinerate the body of a deceased SCP-2833, burning them until there is nothing left. So what exactly are these parasites? Well, they're tiny invertebrates, meaning they're a small, cold-blooded organism with no spine that can live on land or in water. They closely resemble dipterians, which are any order of insects that contain what we know as flies. Red in color and 20 millimeters in length, SCP-2833-As are composed of a combination of muscle tissue, keratin, the protein that your hair, skin, and fingernails are made from, and traces of ash, strangely enough. They are also capable of flying with their two wings, and will use these to attempt to enter the body of a suitable host. While this can be any vertebrate creature, it seems they have a preference for humans. Once inside the host's body, an SCP-2833-A parasite will attach itself to their nervous system. This then allows the SCP-2833 instance that the parasite originated from to control the body of the host, taking over their bodily and motor functions, nervous system, and all of their sensory organs. From here, an SCP-2833 will then either subject the target to vivid, inescapable hallucinations or manipulate the functions of their body. The parasites also contain a miniature instance of another SCP-2833, only about 2 millimeters long. While these mini SCP-2833s are usually chemically inactive, lying dormant and unable to move, this changes if the parasite's host is a human female. In these cases, the SCP-2833-A creature will implant the miniature SCP-2833 within the uterus of their female host. After this, the new SCP-2833 will begin to rapidly grow, consuming any and all organic matter that surrounds it. Once again, the SCP-2833 that the parasite originated from is still able to manipulate the female host's body and will use this control to make her leave her home and travel away from any urban environment. After a year, this new instance of SCP-2833 will be born in a truly horrific fashion. Every time this happens, the female host is unable to survive the process, dying as a result of being used as an incubator for the parasites. The newly formed SCP-2833 will retain all memories of the previous instance that released the parasite. They are even able to speak fluently from the moment they are born, but that isn't the most horrific part. What happens next is that the newborn SCP-2833 will then devour the body of the female host that carried it. Sometimes the host can die before an SCP-2833 is born, with the parasite keeping their body embalmed until the new instance emerges. But regardless, the mother of an SCP-2833 will always die during birth. The SCP Foundation has conducted a number of interviews with the instances of SCP-2833 that they have captured and detained. The first, SCP-2833-1, the man causing civil unrest in Himnatargar, 1969, referred to himself as we, implying that all of the SCP-2833 instances share the same consciousness, acting as a hive mind of sorts. One of the men from the cemetery, SCP-2833-4, elaborated further on the nature of these anomalous beings when asked how many of the instances existed. We are in your cages. We are distant from the hordes of the ignorant. We are grown like crops and livestock. We are growing in numbers and faith, and we will grow until the ascension of Samadeh. Samadeh is beyond sight. The buried will rise to be consumed as the doorway to rebirth. This is our cycle. Waiting for Samadhi with patience, we shall dance the Tandava and consume the world for its rebirth. Samadhi is a word meaning a crypt, usually the final resting place of a saint or someone of religious significance. Additionally, the Tandava is an ancient dance that, according to legends, was performed by the Hindu god Shiva, who is believed to be the source of all things 
the cycle of creation, preservation, and destruction. So these anomalous beings and their parasites appeared to be awaiting the discovery of an ancient burial site, where someone or something was prophesized to rise, consume the world, and then recreate it. Thinking this Samdi might pose a threat, the Foundation probed a later instance of SCP-2833 for further information on its significance. If you intend to seek Samadhi, your quest is in vain, for we are the inheritor to Samadhi. Only we. SCP-2833-42 protested when asked about the Samadhi by a Foundation researcher, one Dr. Sanjay Shiel. Samadhi does not threaten. It is we who were threatened, exiled when the Colossi overran Samadhi. We are the remnants, and we are never defeated. The instance went on. We are of glorious lineage, the chosen stock of Karsis Vasky. Only the strongest and most zealous may serve his purpose. To that end, we consume ourselves to persist and await for Samadhi. When asked who exactly Karsis Vasky was, SCP-2833-42 answered, We are, we are Karsis Vasky. That word. Karsist has long been associated with the religious cult of Sarcasism, another group of interests you are likely to be familiar with if you're a fan of what we do here. This group worships flesh and disease and is seen as an apocalyptic threat by the SCP Foundation. The Sarkis religion was founded thousands of years ago by an ancient elder being known as the Sorcerer King of Aritum, also called Grand Karsist Ion. The goal of Sarcasism is to bring about a new age of flesh, elevating humanity to the form of gods and potentially terraforming the entire Earth using SCP-610, the flesh that hates. So who or what was Karsist Vasky? What role did it have in the religion of Sarcasism and how does it link to SCP-2833? The Foundation has collected a number of documents, once belonging to a man named Sir William Henry Sleeman. Sleeman was an administrator who worked in India on behalf of the British East India Company before his death in 1856, and it is in his documents that some of the answers can be found. According to Sir William, the poor of India told him about a group of mystics who were both revered and feared among the country's peasantry. This group called themselves the Vatula and seemed to hold what Sleeman described as an unusual fetish towards death and decay. Sounds an awful lot like the Sarkists, doesn't it? Sir William heard rumors that these Vatula worshipped Shiva, but were never seen at temples, choosing instead to worship the Hindu god in seclusion. Additionally, though, each member of the Vatula, when asked, identified themselves by the title of Karsist Vasky. Not everyone feared them, however, as a group of men would often attack them. These men were thuggy, organized gangs of professional robbers and murderers that traveled India, strangling their victims to death and robbing them blind. Perhaps because of this, the Vatula seemed wary to interact with any other worshippers of Shiva, often dismissing them as pretenders to the faith. Hoping to appease and gain an audience with the Vatula, Sir William's allies unleashed what they called the Daughter of Shadows, better known as SCP-029. This divided the Thuggy in the hopes that the Vatula would then accept Sleeman as an ally. Eventually, he achieved an audience with them and was unable to determine whether the group was genuinely devoted to their religious beliefs or was just a group of madmen. What Sir William didn't realize was that under the vestige of Karsist Vasky, this group was subtly spreading the influence of Sarkasism over India. As for SCP-2833, perhaps they are the descendants of the Vatula group, their lineage continuing through the passing of those little parasites. It's highly likely that these Vatula were all early instances of SCP-2833, which would explain why those captured by the SCP Foundation claim that they are all Karsist Vasky. A few years back in 2014, one of the Foundation's mobile task forces uncovered a body that was a genetic match to the other instances of SCP-2833. However, this one wasn't found in India, but in Krasnoyarskaya, Russia. It had strange growths on its muscle tissue and bones, carrying multiple SCP-2833-8 parasites inside its internal organs. The body had even been modified to contain an artificial uterus, which carried an infant SCP-2833 instance. It seemed that not only have SCP-2833 found a new way to evolve, carrying themselves in a modified body, but they're also beginning to spread further than ever before. You gotta hand it to the Sarkists. They're certainly adaptable.
Grigory Gusakov and Anatoly Korniev, both aged 10, tiptoed through the dark, deep woods bordering their quaint Russian village of Obrichenye. The year was 1990, a turbulent time for the people of Russia, seeing as the Soviet Union was on the precipice of collapse. But for these two young boys, global geopolitics was the last thing on their minds. They were too busy hunting for the legendary monstrous witch known only as Baba Yaga. For those in our audience who grew up in Eastern Europe, or those at least decently familiar with Slavic folklore and or the John Wick film series, mention of the name Baba Yaga likely sends a slight chill down your spine. And if it doesn't, just wait. By the end of this video, you'll be afraid to go into the woods alone. Not that going with others would save you, as poor little Grigori and Anatoly were about to find out the hard way. They forged on through those witchy woods. By our standards, the boys were tough and headstrong. After all, the Russian wilderness could be a brutal place to grow up, and in a town like Obrichenye, the old ways of stoicism and perseverance were prized over fear and caution. All except for one particular area, the supernatural. Like many small villages all over the world at every point in history, Obrichenye had its fair share of local superstitions. Chief among them was the belief that the local forest was enchanted, and that when people wandered in among the trees, many of them would never return. They would fall into the gnarled clutches of the carnivorous witch Baba Yaga, and their bones would lay among the roots and dead leaves until they someday crumbled into dust. It was starting to get dark out. When the two boys had first set off, it had been with the intention of proving their mettle among the other local children. They didn't fear Baba Yaga. The old witch in the woods was just another fairy story meant to frighten children, and they weren't children anymore, though they would never live to be men. It wasn't long before they were beyond the point of no return. Which way was out and which way was further in? It hardly mattered anymore, as carrion birds cawed far above. The bravado that put them here was starting to falter now, but neither dared show it. They'd rather be put in mortal peril than show fear in front of one another. Was something moving in the distant shadows? A thin, twisted human figure, impossible to make out save for the faint glow of its eyes in the gathering dark? They couldn't tell what was real, and what was their mind playing cruel tricks on them? A hoarse whisper issued through the brittle trees in the moments that followed. It was an ancient voice. A voice that had echoed in the nightmares of generations. A voice that had seen centuries. It spoke in an older Russian dialect that neither of the young boys could understand. But somehow, the essence of its message still rung clear in their hearts and minds. Welcome, little children, to my forest. Here your lives are forfeit. You are my property. I look forward to chewing the tender meat of your young bones. That was all they needed to hear to start running. Gregory and Anatoly turned and fled, screaming for help into the darkness of the forest. Both gasped as they ran through what seemed to be a giant spider web. They spat and spluttered trying to swat away the silky strands as they ran from the voice. Little did they know, what they'd just run through was no spider web. They tried to press on, but their footsteps slowed. The forest was changing around them, twisting, shifting, sparkling. What had seemed terrifying before was suddenly, oddly, beautiful. The two boys just stood and watched as the forest turned into a gorgeous technicolor light show unlike anything they'd ever seen before. Strange figures hopped and danced through the foliage. One tall figure approached them out of the trees, a beautiful, fair-haired maiden. The two boys were entranced by her, their hearts filled with pure golden light. Why were they running before? They couldn't even remember. They just smiled as the woman approached them in her long, flowing dress, smiling back. She was like something out of a fairy tale. They didn't react. They didn't even realize what was happening. As the jaws of the horrible, ancient old crone closed around their skulls for the last time. Grigori and Anatoly were never seen again. Just another two children gone missing in the woods. 
the latest entries on a long list of tragedies to hit the village of Obrichenyi, but they were also the straws that broke the camel's back. The villagers were sick of living in fear under the fabled witch. They would have their revenge. The men of the village gathered up their weapons and formed a hunting party. Guns, torches, knives, axes, and fury. They would slay the beast that had taken so many of their friends and their children in the woods. As soon as their forces were assembled, they charged into the forest looking for blood. With their numerical advantage and single-minded determination, it didn't take them long to find the monster in the woods. She was every bit as hideous and nightmarish as they had anticipated. A gnarled, snarling crone with long clawed fingers and dirty fangs. They got her in their sights and prepared to open fire, but none of them were ready for Baba Yaga's counteroffensive. She moved like a leaf in a strong wind, swift and effortless. The men who'd made the mistake of getting too close to her with knives and axes tasted her terrible wrath. She tore through them with claws like iron, sank her fangs into their flesh, lifted and tossed them like ragdolls. How could she be so fast and so strong? The men were terrified. This was no mere woman. It was a true monster squeezed into a barely human form. By the time the creature was finally incapacitated, it'd taken countless bullets and strikes. How any creature could survive such an assault was unimaginable. Several members of the hunting party were dead by this point. Others had been overtaken by a strange form of madness. A couple of them had been given to constant giggling fits or were speaking long strings of nonsense. Others had been rendered entirely catatonic by the experience. It was clear that the witch had powers beyond their understanding. They needed to return it to the village and destroy it as quickly as possible. The monster was bound and dragged back to Obrichenyi. After seeing how it bewitched some of the men, they avoided direct contact whenever possible. They would do everything they could to see justice done. Of course, there would be no due process for Baba Yaga. The violence that had erupted in the forest was more than enough proof to justify the beast's immediate death sentence. The local priest gave a prayer, though he remarked that he was sure this monster was the creation and servant of the devil, and the execution commenced. A local used a blessed sword, anointed with holy water, to hack off the Baba Yaga's head. Its body was shot several times for good measure, and it was finally doused in gasoline and set on fire. The remains were buried just outside the village limits, hoping that the Baba Yaga's evil wouldn't continue to haunt their town, even in death. Isolated villages in the Russian steppe aren't famous for their communication with outsiders, especially back in 1990 when the Soviet Union was still clinging on to control and the internet was still in its infancy. It took a few weeks for news of a village capturing a so-called local witch to reach the SCP Foundation. After closely studying the peculiar disappearance records in the area, they sent over a detachment of field agents to investigate, and perhaps conduct a few interviews with the locals. They had no way of knowing there wouldn't be any left by the time they arrived. When the field agents reached Obercheny, it was already a ghost town. Not a single survivor was found, only the evidence of fresh carnage. Desiccated bodies were found in some of the village's houses, in others only body parts. A hole in the ground next to the village seemed to show evidence of some subterranean creature clawing its way back up to the top. Whatever this creature was, it clearly crawled back up from the earth and exacted bloody revenge against those who had buried it. Blood trails from some of the bodies leading back into the woods made it clear where the creature had fled to after massacring the entire village. Given the sudden increase in the situation's severity, Mobile Task Force Epsilon-6, aka the Village Idiots, were brought in to apprehend the fugitive witch. But much like the literal village idiots that had come before them, this MTF had no idea what they were up against. They entered the forest outside Obrecheni with superior tactics and weaponry to the villagers, with orders to contain the creature at all costs. They didn't exactly know what they were searching for in the dark amongst the trees, but when the first operatives laid eyes on the twisted old crone, they almost reflexively relaxed their guard. For some of the village idiots, this would be the last mistake 
they ever made. Some of the operatives began to feel funny. Much like Grigori Anatoly and some members of the hunting party, they began to see the forest warping and shifting around them. They giggled at all the funny colors and sighed, feeling an overwhelming sense of calmness and euphoria. It was honestly the best they'd felt in years. Perhaps they were wrong about hunting the witch in here. Maybe the real anomaly here was a Russian forest that made you feel awesome when you stepped inside. While the affected agents were giggling away in their own little La La Land, Baba Yaga was bringing the pain. With the same freakish speed, strength, and ferocity that had surprised the hunting party weeks earlier, the witch was tearing through MTF Epsilon 6, ripping through hardened tactical armor with her long claws and teeth. She took shot after shot, enough tranquilizer to put down an elephant, but she kept fighting. In the end, the training and numerical superiority of the task force won out. They were able to secure and contain the Baba Yaga, soon redesignated SCP-352 and take it to a nearby Foundation containment site for further studies. There they officially recorded all the details, from the creature's incredible speed and strength to its regenerative ability so extensive that it could even survive being decapitated and burned. But what about the hallucinogenic effects? Like a hungry spider, the Baba Yaga's true power comes in her ability to spin a deadly web. Her body is able to produce long, thin, hair-like fibers, each one coated in powerful hallucinogenic enzymes that induce a sense of placid, euphoric stillness in its victims. When it isn't engaging multiple targets, the creature can sometimes take multiple days to consume a single, still-living victim, taking them apart and eating them piece by piece. Speaking of eating, as you can probably imagine, in order to keep SCP-352 uneventfully contained, it's ideal to make sure it isn't hangry. In order to keep 352 well-fed, they need to stock up on its favorite food, human flesh. Though, specifically, 352 has a real hankering for babies. While the Foundation are currently exploring anomalous means of keeping the Baba Yaga fed, until those means are fully ironed out, they need to keep this monster fed the old-fashioned way, only ever withdrawing food as punishment if it attempts to breach containment. After all, there's a very good reason why parents and children across the Slavic world fear Baba Yaga. She's always hungry, and in the end, she always gets what she wants. Who doesn't love their pets, right? Whether it's a dog, a cat, a goldfish, or a hamster, any pet owner will tell you that their furry friend is so much more than just an animal that they adopted. To many, pets become permanent additions to the family. While they might not look like a human being or even have the ability to speak the way we do, a lot of owners view their pets as people in their own right. Of course, a person can't be a pet. At least a human person can't, right? Well, not unless you happen to be a part of SCP-1897, otherwise known as the Human Domestication Society. If you've ever been brave enough to travel alone to the rural parts of southwestern states like Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, Utah, or Nevada, then it's likely you would have been an ideal victim for SCP-1897. This designation doesn't refer to one single creature or entity, but rather a group of similar beings. Witness testimonies and photographs of SCP-1897 depict them as humanoid creatures, standing approximately 5 meters in height. These beings have displayed a speed and strength far beyond that of any human. They are capable of traveling roughly 200 meters in only 9 seconds, and lifting weights of up to 500 kilos with a single hand. These entities are not immortal, and can be harmed by conventional means. But that doesn't mean it's an easy task. Any SCP-1897 instance that is killed or incapacitated immediately vanishes, resulting in them dropping anything that they may have been carrying at the time. And surprisingly, these are not mindless monsters, and actually appear to be capable of communication. Furthermore, they do not seem to speak a unique or distinct language, but instead communicate in standard American English, with accents and vernacular appropriate to the regions they appear in. However, they will actively refuse to reply to any human that attempts to engage them in conversation. Now, these creatures don't spend every waking hour of the day roaming around the states of Texas, Oklahoma, and all the others we listed. If they did, it's likely a lot more civilians would have spotted them by now. 
and would probably live their lives in fear of these gigantic 5-meter-tall humanoids. But instances of SCP-1897 will only manifest if certain specific criteria are met, and these are as follows. To encounter SCP-1897, a person must be alone or part of a group of no more than two. If more than one person is with them, then no manifestation will occur. There is one exception to the rule, if a child under the age of 12 is present. Secondly, neither the person nor anyone with them can be carrying any kind of weapon. That means no knives, no guns, not even pepper spray. Third and finally, they must be at least 25 meters from a major population center. And what happens when all of these conditions are met and one of these creatures appears? Anyone witnessing their arrival will notice the creatures materializing, appearing to emerge from some form of unseen vehicle. When they manifest, the SCP-1897 entities are almost always carrying long poles with large nets at the end, as well as steel cages, and are often seen wearing dark green uniforms. In most cases, they will attempt to capture any nearby person in a way that causes them the least possible harm. Should an SCP-1897 creature successfully apprehend a person and place them in a cage, both them and their captive will vanish in a similar manner to the way the creature appeared. All attempts to track SCP-1897 or one of its abducted victims have failed. There is no way to know where they are taken. But as far as what happens to them, that we do have a little more insight to. Sometimes, although it is a highly rare occurrence, the captured human victims may reappear around a month after their capture. While never in the same location as where they disappeared from, they will always be accompanied by an SCP-1897 instance and will stay close by the creature's side. At this point, the abductee is barely human anymore. They are considered an instance of what is known as SCP-1897-1. What signifies this sudden and drastic transformation? For one, these victims are always found to have been forcibly castrated or sterilized, essentially no longer able to reproduce the way humans naturally do. For another, these instances of SCP-1897-1 universally display a decreased level of cognitive and mental function. What we mean is that their brains do not function the way they should anymore. Instead, these abductees exhibit the same level of intelligence and capability as the average Canis lupus familiaris, otherwise known as the common domestic dog. Should someone attempt to rescue a person that has become an instance of SCP-1897-1, or display hostility towards the SCP-1897 creature that accompanies them, they will be met with outward animalistic aggression from the victim. It has been discovered by the SCP Foundation that these behaviors can be treated with amnestics. Unfortunately, though, the process of an abducted person becoming an SCP-1897-1 instance seems to be the result of an invasive medical procedure known as a lobotomy. This typically involves removing or disabling certain parts of the human brain, meaning that what has been done to these victims is permanent and cannot be reversed. So who is doing all of this? Why are these creatures collecting innocent human beings only to reduce them to little more than animals? The answers lie in something currently referred to as SCP-1897-2. Not another creature or entity, not an anomalous artifact or location with strange properties, but a website found at the address www.hdsociety.gov. According to the information on this site, it belongs to a group calling themselves the Human Domestication Society. The website features pages such as adoption, training, breeding programs, volunteering, and more. The fact that this is the kind of website you might expect to be about dogs or cats but instead focuses on the domestication of humans is certainly enough to turn the stomach. As we said at the start of the video, surely a human being can't be somebody's pet, right? Wrong at least as far as the Human Domestication Society goes. Their website contains everything and anything one of these SCP-1897 creatures could ever hope to learn about owning a human as a pet. Has your human been misbehaving? Need to train them to use the toilet? These pages have all the information you need to help your human become the most well-trained human on your block. Boast the training page of www.hdsociety.gov. The remainder of the page contains links to various articles such as obedience training, 
which claims an owner of a human can show them who's boss without the need for physical violence. Also featured are mentions of how to toilet train or play fetch with a human, how to introduce a human to others due to them naturally not getting along. Perhaps most chilling of all is one article titled, Understanding What Your Human Wants, that warns human beings shouldn't talk. And another, Dealing with Strays, offers tips for anyone wanting to learn to capture their own pets themselves. It doesn't seem like too much of a leap to think that the SCP-1897 creatures have followed a lot of the advice from this particular article. Arguably worst of all is an image featured on the website of a tall, menacing SCP-1897 entity brandishing a Picana Electrica. This device, for any unfamiliar with the term, is a form of high-voltage electrical cattle prod, normally used for the purposes of torture. In the photograph in question, the creature is wielding one of these while standing sternly over a helpless captive human male, now an instance of SCP-1897-1 with tears in his eyes. Further pages found on www.hdsociety.gov recommend solutions to certain human behaviors. For example, like one might expect to find on other pet care websites, some of the Human Domestication Society's articles pertain to dealing with aggression, grooming, house training, and even toilet training. Then there's the adoption page, which states, We offer a large variety of humans for adoption every single day. While we cannot guarantee a human you see listed on our website will be available when you reach the shelter, our inventory is updated every half hour. We cannot answer any questions about specific humans pictured on our website over the phone or email. It is still unclear whether or not the SCP-1897 creatures that have been known to appear in the southwestern United States are sent out to gather humans en masse to offer for adoption, or whether these creatures are individuals trying to obtain human pets on their own. Of course, the worst conceivable answer is both. The site is horrifyingly comprehensive, with links to an actual human ownership convention, with panels on breeding and preventing illegal human poaching and skinning. It's safe to say if that you were ever unlucky enough to read this website, it would haunt you for life. Naturally, the SCP Foundation has made several attempts to contact the owners of this website. They tried in vain to communicate through the official channels about SCP-1897-1 adoption as a way of peacefully negotiating that the Human Domestication Society website be shut down, as well as its practices of capturing, lumbotomizing, breeding, and adopting humans. However, these communication attempts were met with silence. That is, until a message was received by the Foundation at Site-06, addressed to a member of personnel that does not exist. No data pertaining to the physical location of the sender could be derived from the email, but it was traced to the same IP address as the Human Domestication Society's website. The email read as follows. We will not listen to your lies any longer. It was you who came after us first. You who tore holes in our world and tried to annihilate us. You who took our olive branch of peace and fashioned it into a spear. You who nearly drove us to extinction. And now that we have the advantage, you attempt to patronize us with your crocodile tears. We will not be deceived again. But unlike you, we are not monsters. We have much anger towards your kind, but we are willing to forgive. But first, you must be willing to change. Slavery and genocide are immoral, and not even you deserve such a fate. It is our belief, then, that this alternative is a fair compromise between guaranteeing our safety and allowing your kind to live. This is our mercy to you. Look at the humans who have gone through our program. See how much happier they are? Your correspondence tells us that you have seen them. See how much they love us. Why, then, do you continue to be defiant? Someday you will thank us. Please try to understand that this is for your own good. For now, there is little that the SCP Foundation can do to prevent the Human Domestication Society from abducting human beings to sell as pets to other SCP-1897 creatures. Civilian access to the hdsociety.gov website has been restricted, so we recommend you stop typing into the search bar of your browser to go take a peek. Yes, we mean you. Seriously, stop that. As for the entities that have appeared in the rural areas of the southwestern states, all the Foundation can do is position its agents nearby, in the hopes that they can detain and neutralize the SCP-1897s as they appear, 
with lethal force if necessary. At present, the only procedure for any human pets that are successfully recaptured is to have them moved safely to containment until a way of rehabilitating them is found. So far, there hasn't been any luck on that front. Help me! Would somebody please help me? I'm lost and I can't see! It echoed through the alley in a thin, reedy voice that suggested brittleness of body and spirit. Who wouldn't hear that cry and feel a pang of sympathy? Are you so heartless that you'd ignore the desperate pleas for help of a blind man clearly in distress? For all you know, he might even be in danger. What if he walks into a road and gets hit by a car? Would you really want that on your conscience? Questions like these were flying through the head of the Good Samaritan when he decided to go and investigate, when it seemed like everyone else was just content to pretend they didn't hear it and carry on with their day as normal. The Good Samaritan was a person not unlike yourself. They were also the kind of person we all hoped and wished we would be in a situation such as this. Kindness and generosity is a virtue, after all. The problem is there are people out there who know this and are willing to take advantage of that kindness and generosity. But even worse is the fact that there are things that are definitely not people out there willing to take advantage of human compassion, too. But back to the Good Samaritan. He approached the sound of the distressed man in the alley. He looked old and frail, hunched over with the weight of his years. He wore thick, dark glasses, and his white cane was laying on the road a few feet away from him. It was a tragic scene, but thankfully the Good Samaritan was here to help. He approached the old man calmly, telling him that it would be okay. The Good Samaritan picked up the walking cane and passed it over to the blind old man. His face spread into a warm smile and he said, Thank you, thank you, thank you, young man. It warms my heart to know there are still good people like you on this earth. The old man told the Good Samaritan that he'd come into town to get some fresh air and a little exercise, at which point he'd gotten lost. When the Good Samaritan asked whether it was safe for him to come alone, the old man told him that he always used to go on walks with his wife, but ever since the accident, she didn't seem to want to be seen in public. The Good Samaritan naturally felt for the old man, who seemed as sweet as he was feeble. He offered to escort the old man back to his house personally, wanting to make sure that he returned home safely. The old man smiled and graciously accepted, saying that his wife would probably want to thank the kind young man for helping him in person. Of course, the Good Samaritan was so wrapped up in the warm glow of doing a good deed that he never once stopped to question the strangeness of this whole situation. He just walked along with the old man, listening to him tell his fanciful stories as they left the city center and crept further into the sleepy outskirts of their small Kentucky town. He was just rambling on as old men tend to do. He told the Good Samaritan a little more about his beloved wife. She was a kind woman who he'd known for as long as he could remember. His elementary school sweetheart, then his high school girlfriend, and not long after they graduated, his beautiful blushing bride. Oh yes, she'd always been the prettiest lady, until the accident. Curiosity was getting the better of him. The Good Samaritan couldn't help but ask what exactly the accident he kept alluding to was, and the old man was all too happy to give him an answer. Not that this answer was, in any way, pleasant. His wife had been trapped in a terrible fire in town that gave her severe burns all over her body. She was lucky to be alive, but the flames took her beauty and her confidence away from her. Since then, she'd become a real homebody, often refusing to leave the house and rarely ever letting strangers see her. The Good Samaritan's heart ached for this poor old couple. Why were such nice people often forced to endure so much suffering? Did this old man even have anyone else to talk to? They reached his house soon enough. It was the furthest one on the end of the street, right next to the darkness of the woods. It looked old and dilapidated, but it wasn't like the old blind man could even know that. As they were walking up the small set of stairs to the porch, the old man stumbled slightly, causing his thick, dark glasses to fall to the floor. The Good Samaritan reflexively leaned over to pick up the glasses for the old man. As he passed them back, he noticed something strange. The old man wasn't just blind, he literally didn't have any eyes. Just two black, empty sockets where his eyes should be. The Good Samaritan was just thankful that the old man wasn't able to see him staring as he put the glasses back on. The two of them entered the house, 
The Good Samaritan was too busy thinking about the old man's empty eye sockets to even notice him locking the door behind them, and by then, it was already too late for him. The old man called out into the dark expanse of the house. Sweetheart, I've got you alive, one! Before the Good Samaritan could ask what he actually meant by that, the old man shuffled off, deftly navigating the halls through memory alone, and took one of the two seats at the dining table. He just sat there, smiling, waiting. That's when the Good Samaritan heard the creaking sound coming from above, something moving up in the darkness of the second floor, and then descending the stairs with heavy, clomping footsteps. When his eyes came into focus in the dark, he saw it there, the most terrifying thing he'd ever witnessed, coming down the stairs towards him. It was vaguely human in its shape alone, but in all other respects, it was a monster through and through. This gnarled, twisted creature with bulging eyes, dead flesh, and filthy, exposed fangs, like it stepped straight out of a nightmare and into the physical world where it did not belong. There looked to be a huge hole in its lower torso, too, with no blood or organs inside, just an infinite blackness. The creature's lipless mouth twisted into a smile. The creature said something in a voice that the Good Samaritan couldn't understand. It was the black tongue, something ancient, terrifying, and unknown. As the creature got closer and closer, the Good Samaritan turned and made a run for the door. He tried to figure out the lock, his hands fumbling and uncoordinated by fear. He could hear the footsteps and the heavy breathing of that thing getting closer behind him. He was so close, almost there. That's when a strange black substance seemed to encase the world around him. It separated him from the door he was so nearly able to breach, locking him in. He was trapped inside what looked like a giant black sphere made of some unknown material or energy. He turned to see that monster standing right behind him, just grinning and waiting for the inevitability of the situation to sink in. The Good Samaritan had never been more terrified. Something else began to shift inside the sphere. A structure was growing out of the ground, up and around him, like a cage within a cage. He was trapped, and huddled inside a strange conical structure, as more figures entered the sphere around him. They were just like the first, this horrible horde of desiccated not-people, all with grinning, lipless mouths. When they closed in on him, the Good Samaritan had the one consolation that at least it was over. But it wasn't. Not yet. The blind old man waited in the kitchen for five hours as unmentionable horrors unfolded inside the black sphere. The Good Samaritan was actually lucky all in all, because for some sessions for victims inside the sphere had lasted as long as 27 hours. He screamed the entire time, with the sphere finally demanifesting just moments after the screaming stopped. Remaining was only one of the creatures, but no Good Samaritan. Just several neat piles of human organs arranged by organ type. Are you down in there, honey? The blind old man asked. I've been getting awfully hungry. The creature replied in perfect English. Yes, yeah. I think you have some supper before you go to bed. The creature picked up some of the discarded organs and took them into the kitchen, where it began cooking them into a stew for the old man. He ate the stew not long after, blissfully ignorant to its contents, and went to sleep. Whatever organs from the Good Samaritan weren't used in the stew were simply thrown into the fireplace to burn away into ashes. Later that night, the old man would die peacefully of a heart attack in his sleep at age 81. He spent the latter 10 years of his life in service of SCP-957. He'd never even had a wife, and when the monster first invaded his home, he wasn't even blind. He'd simply come home one day to find SCP-957 lurking in his home, waiting for him. As far as the SCP Foundation is aware, it always targets people who live alone. The man had tried to resist, but the creature was freakishly strong in spite of its wiry frame. It grabbed him, and forced his body into the dark gaping chasm of its chest. He was swallowed up into another world on the other side of the void, and returned four hours later, a changed man. His eyes were gone, and he now firmly believed that SCP-957 was his beloved, if burnt scarred, wife of many years. He'd do anything for her, even heading out into the world and feigning distress to lure people back into her terrible clutches. 
That's how the old man became SCP-957-1. He wasn't the first, and wouldn't be the last. With the old man now dead, SCP-957 would demanifest and head off in search of a new victim, invading their home and repeating the cycle once more somewhere else. The somewhat happy ending is that in one of these cases, the SCP Foundation somehow got wise to the baiting activities of SCP-957, and they were able to contain the creature, giving it the Keter object class for its frequent attempts to either get out or lure in new victims. It's never been actively hostile to Foundation researchers and guards, just a little obtuse. Despite the fact that it's perfectly capable of speaking fluent English, it prefers to speak in an unknown dead language for somewhat mysterious reasons. Very little is known about the origins or true nature of SCP-957, but our brief glimpse into its interior life does little to comfort us. In 2008, the Foundation recorded 957 having a conversation with an unseen individual in its native tongue. Foundation linguistic experts have been able to partially crack the code on what was being said that day. 957 asked the unseen figure how much longer it would have to stay here. The figure told it that it would need to wait there for a while, and that its disguise was extremely convincing. 957 complained that being here was boring and tiresome, but the unseen figure urged 957 to remain patient. It said, We have to let them watch the view, so that the many can move freely. We will be done without research soon enough. Before we start today's video, we need to ask you a question. Are you alone in the room? Seriously, are you alone? You may think the room around you is empty, but how can you really know that, right? Think of the technology out there being developed by groups like DARPA, the CIA, or even the SCP Foundation. Secret agents in cloaking suits could be standing around you right now, watching your every move without you even knowing. You could tell someone about this, but if you did, they'd think you're crazy. And nobody believes crazy people, do they? Sometimes people's whole worlds just collapse. One day they're living happy, successful lives with families and friends who love and care about them. Then the next day, they're truly convinced that the US government is tapping not only their phone calls and their emails, but their thoughts. Perhaps even putting dangerous brainwaves directly into their mind. Or they start to believe that those loving family members and friends seek to do them harm. Maybe they start to believe their food is poisoned and stop eating, causing them to waste away from malnutrition. Most terrifying of all, maybe they start to see things that nobody else could see. Monsters that defy rationality and shake the very soul. Terrible, terrible things. These are all sadly relatively common symptoms of someone suffering from a severe case of schizophrenia a mental illness with a wide range of detrimental effects to sufferers, first and foremost giving them an incredibly complicated relationship with reality. There's sadly a lot of misconceptions in the media about people who suffer from illnesses like schizophrenia, painting them as unstable individuals who present a danger to the people around them. In reality, people with a condition like these are three times more likely to be a victim of a violent crime, and they're also more likely to be a victim of something else, too. Like we said earlier, sometimes people's worlds just collapse, and in severe cases, they might simply drop off the map. And nine times out of ten, the reason for that is SCP-870, the maybe there monsters. Take the experience of Katrina Wayne. She was an office temp in Tallahassee, Florida, with an undiagnosed case of mild schizophrenia. For the most part, she was able to operate just fine at her job, getting her work done at a satisfactory level while also maintaining a decent social life after hours. It came as a shock to everyone when she began screeching horrifically in the middle of the office. She backed herself up against the wall, picking up nearby objects and throwing them into the aisles at some invisible foe. And this isn't a metaphor. There really was an invisible foe moving towards her, and only she could truly see it. Seeing the huge, scaly body of a mature alligator from the Florida Everglades moving towards you would be scary enough on its own, but this wasn't any ordinary alligator. Its long reptilian head had three eyes instead of two, and it moved towards her on eight huge, articulated spider legs. It was like something straight out of a nightmare. Katrina was put on leave due to a stress-induced mental breakdown and prescribed a course of antipsychotic medication by a psychiatrist. She disappeared from her home without a trace a mere two weeks later. Or take the story of Daryl Simon. 
He was a mechanic working in Michigan with a family history of schizophrenia, though he'd never been officially diagnosed himself. He was working on the engine of a vintage Corvette when something strange happened. His garage began to fill up with smoke. He considered that at first perhaps it was some kind of engine malfunction causing smoke to belch out of the old Corvette's tailpipe. But then he saw something standing in the smoke. A human figure. Daryl suddenly felt a profound sense of dread seeping into his mind. He grabbed a monkey wrench and began to slowly approach the intruder standing in the smoke. It was only when he was already too close that he realized the figure wasn't just standing in the smoke. It was made of smoke. The second he noticed this, the figure's eyes opened glowing red. Its smoky face opened into a wide, toothy mouth and let out an ear-splitting shriek. Daryl suddenly found himself running as the creature gave chase. He threw his wrench as it ran. It breezed through the creature's semi-intangible form. Daryl was found later that day huddled in the corner of his garage, muttering incoherently. After seeing a mental health professional and sharing his story, he was given a schizophrenia diagnosis. He was given a mix of talk therapy and medication, and seemed to be improving over time. He would occasionally report hallucinations of the man made of smoke, watching from the corner of his eye, but it was dismissed as nothing more than that, a hallucination. A month later, he was gone, never to be seen again. But he wasn't the only one to fall victim to the anomaly. Shirley Nicholson, a retiree whose schizophrenic symptoms developed later in life, was having a quiet evening in her home when she first encountered an instance of SCP-870. She was watching a game show on television when she heard a strange noise coming from her kitchen, a rustling, like someone was messing with the food inside her fridge. Of course, she always had a tendency to hear things, which was why she wasn't that nervous when she got up and walked to the kitchen. That sense of confidence didn't last long. When she entered the kitchen, she saw the fridge door open, with the back half of what looked like a giant ant emerging from it. Her breath caught in her throat. That giant ant, which seemed to be eating the food inside her fridge, suddenly froze, seeming to realize that Shirley had entered the room. When it backed out of the fridge, Shirley couldn't help but scream. Instead of antennas and mandibles, the giant ant had a grinning human face. As Shirley screamed, the giant ant's human face began to cackle with sadistic glee. Its jaw began to stretch open, impossibly wide, exposing the never-ending darkness within. Shirley turned and ran as the creature skittered towards her at a frightening speed. Adrenaline kicked in and Shirley ran for her life as the monster pursued her through the house. It was only when she ran out into the street and was seen by others in this bizarre outburst that the horrifying ant monster seemed to disappear. And several weeks after her schizophrenia diagnosis, Shirley Nicholson sadly disappeared too. Before she vanished, she made a panicked 911 call, where she screamed down the line that the monster had come back. No explanation has yet to be found, but there are more cases to be investigated still. Don Jones, who had a documented history with schizophrenia, had his SCP-870 experience while waiting for the bus out of town late one October evening. He was checking his phone at the bus stop when he saw a figure shuffling towards him in the distance. He tried to ignore it at first. Years of therapy had taught him to try his best to ignore these strange little anomalies. He had been medicated for years, and while occasionally he had minor episodes, he'd lived with the condition for long enough now that he'd learned how to cope. That was when the strange shuffling figure got closer. Don looked up just for a moment to see the thing coming towards him out of the dark. It was about the size of a child, though a little shorter because of how far the creature was hunched over. Literally, hunched. The entity had a rather prominent hunchback. But this wasn't nearly as noticeable as the thing's face. It had the head of a particularly mangy-looking parrot, its curved beak caked in what looked like old blood. This was stranger than some of the hallucinations he'd suffered in the past. It looked more tangible, more real, even after years of medication and therapy. He felt nervous as the thing approached him. On some subconscious level, he knew the thing intended to harm him in one way or another. When it opened its mouth and sunk the bladed tip of its beak into Don's hand, he knew that he wasn't dealing with any mundane fantasy here. He screamed and ran off into the night, the monster giving chase. He later reported the incident to the police, but his fears were written off when his medical history came to light. Everyone just assumed the man was experiencing another episode and that the wound in his hand was self-inflicted. Of course, as you've probably gathered by this point, poor Don Jones would disappear without a trace not long after. Still, the testimonies get freakier. A warehouse security guard, Alex Landry, had his terrifying encounter while on the job. 
He was on his nightly patrol when he heard a strangely soft skittering noise coming from inside the warehouse. He deployed his flashlight and ran inside after radioing for assistance. He was expecting maybe an escaped animal or a young hoodlum messing around inside. What he didn't expect was a face-to-face -face encounter with pure terror. As his flashlight beam traced its way up to the top of the warehouse, he saw a monster crawling across the ceiling. It was a giant 15-foot-long centipede, but instead of having normal centipede legs, it had scores of twitching, grasping human arms. He was found in a comatose state by his partner, and spent the brief rest of his life in a psychiatric facility before, you guessed it, disappearing without a trace. And most exhilaratingly, we come to the tale of Mr. Holgate, which both ends a little more hopeful for him, but paints a grim picture of what happened to everyone else. Mr. Holgate had encountered a spider-like creature with a freakish number of legs, which he soon realized only he could see. During his periods of observation, he'd seen the creature both devour a ruler, as in the measurement device, not a king, as well as swallow a human whole after an extended period of stalking the victim, leaving nothing behind, just like the SCP-870 instances had done to all of their other victims. When the monster eventually came for Holgate, he was ready. It ran screeching towards him on its too many legs, and Holgate whipped out a gun and shot it. The Foundation had prioritized the capture or destruction of SCP-870. It's believed to be not a single instance, but an entire species, living out there, preying on humans and hiding in the space between our perceptions. Even two schizophrenic people looking at the same instance will report seeing completely different entities. The monsters are all the more dangerous due to the fact that sufferers of severe schizophrenia often report hallucinations of strange monsters or entities, so their pleas for help are often ignored by neurotypical authorities. Neurotypical meaning those who don't experience any form of mental illness, personality disorder, or developmental condition. People who can never see SCP-870 coming until they're already being swallowed whole. The lead researcher on the SCP-870 case follows up the file on the monsters with an ominous note that leaves little comfort for even those of us who don't suffer from schizophrenia. The note reads, I personally don't believe that the schizophrenics are really seeing SCP-870 fully. They can just see it more than us. We don't see it because our brains aren't made to see it. The schizophrenics. Their brains are wired up just that tiny bit differently, and they can see it just a tiny bit more. These things have the perfect camouflage, and we simply are unable to see through it. To return to what we said at the very beginning of this video, look around the room and answer our question. Are you alone? Now, at least you know the answer to that question may not be as simple as it seems. Now go check out Evil Monster created by SCP Foundation SCP-2419 The Laughing Men and Revenge of D-Class Ghosts SCP-4973 Dead Men Walking for more scary anomalous beings that'll have you looking over your shoulder.